Hi, I'm Wendy Padbury, and this is The Sirens of Audio. Oh, yes, quite so. Yes, of course, I do know the medium. G'day audiophiles, this is the Sirens of Audio, the show that explores the universe of Doctor Who in the audio medium. I'm Dwayne. And I'm Philip. G'day, Dwayne. G'day, audiophiles. G'day, Philip. How are you? I am excellent, thank you. And how are you That's going? good to hear. Yeah, I'm I'm very well. I'm uh, even further off-grid at the moment, so if my battery runs out halfway through this, uh, please forgive me. You'll have to carry on without <laughs> me, but I should be, I'm in the, I'm in outback Western Australia at the moment in a place called Karajini. So if you've uh, ever been to Karajini or heard of Karajini, it's uh, got spectacular gorges, which I've visited a couple of them so far, and they're absolutely stunning places. G gorgeous gorges. But gorgeous gorges. But we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about Doctor Who on audio. And we have with us, joining us for the show today, uh, one of the uh, writers from Big Finish and uh, someone who's had a couple of releases released over just over the last few weeks, actually. It's David K. Barnes. G'day, David. Hello there. Hello. Nice G'day, David. Hello. Great to have you. Hello, Phil. Hello, Dwayne. <laughs> How are things over where you are? They are all right. This is still sort of late morning here in Britain. It is Britain and therefore it is raining. So there we go. Well, that's a shock, isn't it? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> yeah, our, our, our weather's turning cold. He was just only 33 degrees today. <laughs> oh no, freezing. We we yeah. just we just definitely on its way now. Yeah, Dave was just telling me about he was telling me about his uh, voyage to the in the outback and the uh, the blistering temperatures, which are more than I could ever ever stand at all in my life. So well done. That's that's quite something, I think. Uh, oh, well, I I was telling you what the temperature it was when I was camping off grid, but the hottest we got while we were driving, doing some touring around, was forty nine degrees. Forty nine it was on the on the dashboard. And I could not believe it. It was so hot. It, I was laughing. It was funny. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. How does how does I that mean, sit? How does that sit with a Brit? <laughs> like, I mean, like a cloudy day is a bit much for me. So, I forty nine. No, <laughs> no, not at all. Not doing that. All right. We want to talk to you about your writing and particularly your most recent releases, uh, "Storm of the Sea Devils" and a couple from the classic Doctors. Uh, new Monsters box set that's just been released, uh, and some of your other great stories too. But before we do that, Philip, do you know what? No, what, Dwayne? We need to jump down the rabbit hole. Let's go. Come on. Me, me. <laughs> All right, here we are in the rabbit hole. And uh, this is a bit of a different one, Philip, because you know what's coming because I posted up on our group page a couple of days ago. Yes, you, you uh, let other question. people know, you let other people know what the rabbit hole topic is, just never me. Yeah, you, well, well, yeah, well, you, you saw the message, didn't you? you I did. A, I yeah. Was very so, yeah, so um, this this topic is, well, I'll read it straight from the, from the message that I put in our group, because we've got some comments back from listeners too, which we're going to share with you and get some thoughts from you too, David, hopefully. Um, has there been any episode of Doctor Who, whether on TV or audio, that you absolutely despised when you first heard or saw it, but now you think it's a work of genius? And why do you think that? And I was inspired uh, to ask that question because I was watching The Happiness Patrol, and that was a story that I absolutely hated. And I was watching it with my kids the other day, just with my, my eyes almost rolling, th uh, just thinking how wonderful it was. And it particularly could be a wonderful audio story too, that story. But I'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, Philip, is there any any stories that stand out for you in that when I asked that question? Well, it, it was interesting because you immediately went to the Happiness Patrol. And so my thinking was classic series. And there's no classic series episode I despised or hated on first viewing. So my immediate thought was no. And I think actually I think I answered no in the uh in the group. But I actually thought about it a bit more. There, there are more recent stories that I have not enjoyed. 
I think despise is a strong word. Um, but some of them I've actually never, never gone back to watch again. <laughs> so there's a couple of seasons where I've only ever seen the show once. And my daughter, who I watched a lot with, with, would doubt that too, because we got them very early in the morning in Australia. Oh. And so I used to get up early in the morning and watch them when they first got onto ABC iView. And so my daughter says, actually, I haven't actually seen a lot of them because I slept through large chunks of it um, <laughs> because I was quite bored. So I actually haven't been back and seen some of, some of those. Um, in, in terms of reflection, though, they, I've recently rewatched all the Peter Capaldi stories, and some of them on the way through I didn't enjoy that much. But having gone back and watched them again, they have actually have improved a lot. So I actually think I was too harsh on some of the Peter Capaldi stories on the way through, and I've actually revised my thinking about them. I didn't despise them on the way through, but they actually were a lot more better ones in there, and actually some really good ones in there that don't spring to mind when I first think of Top Doctor Who, but he's actually superb. And watching him act again and what he did, actually, I, I totally underestimated Peter Capaldi as a doctor, and I've, I've revised him totally. So that, does that answer the question? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that answer. Absolutely. Good. All right. We'll come to you in a moment, David, but I'll read a comment or two and see uh, what the three of us think of these. Kieran Moffat says, Kinder, as a kid, the dream sequences bothered me, not to mention Nissa being regulated to the TARDIS. But as an adult, I find myself continually blown away by Simon Rouse's haunting and accurate portrayal of a man suffering a nervous breakdown. Honorable mention to The Beast Below which I watched last weekend for the first time since transmission and thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, yeah, Kinder is an interesting one. What are, what are your thoughts on, on those comments there, David? Yeah, I think um, the stories which stories that we saw as children and how that can change over time, but they're the ones when I was I mean, I, similar, I, I don't think there's any Doctor Who story I absolutely despised, but they're the ones that I didn't like much. And I remember as a, as, as a kid, um, some of the stories I just didn't really like, and certain ones I didn't get through. Uh, the Time Meddler was was one. You know, in in, in the nineties, there was a TV channel called UK Gold that used to do all the uh, Doctor Who's. Originally, it was like Tom Baker episodes on weekday nights, just individually, and then they had the omnibuses on the weekend. And that's how I got into Doctor Who. That's how I first saw it. And uh, Tom Baker was my first. I loved all the Tom Baker stories, uh, and then I was fascinated to go back to all the other eras. But I found particularly like the yeah the. It, the historical stories were ones that at that time I wasn't as keen on. I remember trying to watch The Time Meddler a couple of times and just not really getting it and finding it very slow and giving up around about part two when the Doctor disappears. Um, I think the Romans I also just didn't get and they just didn't grab me. Now, I absolutely love the historical stories. I love those two stories in particular. Time Meddler is my favourite Hartnell. You know, I love them. I love the wit. I love the uh, the intelligence in the scripts of the character interaction. I think when you're like sort of eight or nine, ten and you kind of, you, you like the monsters chasing people down the corridors they, they don't have as much to offer now i i the monster stuff yeah i i enjoy that sure but i would rather have some great character actors sitting in a room and having a great conversation um and i love those stories and just him actually one story of course one of the all-time classics and one of my favorites now but one story i really did not like when i first saw it was city of death which of course the pinnacle yeah. of the douglas adams time and and season 17 and all that First time I watched it, very, very young, probably at 11 or 12, and I just didn't get it. I just thought it was quite, what's going on? Why are these people just standing around having these long conversations? Why aren't they just shooting each other and get it over with? Now, of course, you know, later on I rewatched it, later teens, and now you go, oh, of course it's genius. Of course it's superlative. It's beautiful. and Everything about it is wonderful. Mm. But I think those stories which grow a yeah, really, we, we, we come to, to love later on as adults. So some, maybe those on the slightly talkiest stories, the ones with the themes that we just, we just not plugged into when we're kids. And then as, as they, over time, you really start to enjoy them and appreciate what they were doing and equally possibly understand why the historicals didn't do well with kids at the time, uh, which is a shame. But I, I guess if you've seen 12 episodes of the Daleks, you don't necessarily want four episodes of Catholic Zertus Protestants in the in in in, in, uh, in, in historical France. <laughs> but uh, hey, I like that story now, but I didn't see it in the 60s when I was six years old. So, you know. Yeah, it's interesting that the, the time meddler always had a, a mystique about it to me. Mm. When I eventually got to see it, I was somewhat surprised. But it was the target novelization that I mm -hmm. read first of the Time mm -hmm. Meddler and the cover of yes. the monk 
just the just the monk on the cover is nothing like he is in the TV serial, but that sort of that image grabbed me and that sort of Im imprinted itself on my mind. So uh, it's, uh, yeah, I always, I've always said the time middle is my favorite, but I don't know, maybe I, I change from time to time uh, with my favorites with, uh, with that particular era. But very interesting. Uh, shall we go to another comment, Philip? Mm, let's. Uh, Alex Pass says Delta and the Bannermen. As a kid, I thought it was silly and, Full of all that lovey dovey stuff. Watching again some 30 years later, it was a great laugh, though myself and my daughter still found the romance a bit cringy. Um Dirty Dancing. Dirty Dancing? <laughs> well, it's set, it's, set, it's, set, it's set in the same sort of, you know, theme parky, you know, everyone goes away and stays at campsite in lodges, and it's, it's the same sort of location, just an American version with yeah. romance. But I was like Heidi High as well, so I Actually, no, I, I didn't see Heidi High until after I'd seen Delta and the Bannerman, and then it sort of sort of translates back, yeah, back to that. So, Holdy Ho, um, yeah, that went for years. That show didn't it? Went for yeah. basically well, all the eighties. I'm not sure it was very good though. Now think about it, but I do remember <laughs> watching it a lot. Actually, let me talk about my story, the the Happiness Patrol, and what. I, I never, I, I still don't really relate too much to the Margaret Thatcher satire side of things. But what I really love about this is the richness of every single character that comes in. And there are a lot of them, a lot of those amazing characters. And if, you, if you've watched those classic years of Doctor Who, you'll, you'll notice through the 80s, there's lots of different faces th from throughout throughout the eighties up to that point that are in the happiness patrol, you know, sort mm -hmm. of flashbacks to gaze of Androzani and Frontios and, you know, other, other bits and pieces as well. Um, but I, I was thinking to myself that this, this would make a great audio too. So it's really confined studio based story, which would really lend itself well to audio. However, probably the large cast may make it a bit tricky for the kind of audio we're used to listening to these days. Uh, you'd probably have some thoughts on the size of the cast of the Happiness Patrol, as far as audio goes, David. Yeah, I mean, it's. Um, I think there's something absolutely to that. It's, um, you know, the few, as we know, the fewer characters on audio, the easier it is to juggle in your head. And the Happiness Patrol, like a lot of those McCoy stories, has they have expanded casts of people who sort of pop in for the odd little scenes and wander away again. I mean, I remember, I think Battlefield kind of like sticks half its cast on a, on, a, on a on a jeep and drives them away in part way episode three going we, we don't know what to do with you there are too many people here but it's interesting i think you so the the, the happiness patrol is and, and delta and the bannerman as well these are stories which i think whereas i said sometimes as a child you saw stories that maybe you just didn't connect with and seemed boring and now they're great this is the other side stories that just seemed a bit too silly and especially you know, i love happiness patrol i love delta and the bannerman i think they are terrific funny subversive weird weird stories that so there's stuff um there's you know i can't imagine any other television program having episodes like dodge and the bannerman and happiness patrol let alone series which then could switch to a totally different tone the following week but i think they're very rich and exciting stories but i say that as somebody who sort of came to them in later teens and now appreciates them as an adult and you know I, I think if you, you, I can sit down and watch a Happiness Patrol and go, oh, wonderful, fun, Candyman, brilliant. I don't have to go to school the next day and meet like school bullies who I said, were you watching Doctor Who last night? Were you watching that rubbish with that stupid robot made sweet? Uh, and like you know, getting attacked there. And I remember a lot of people like, I think a lot of people who took against the Happiness Patrol at the time were people who might have still been at school at the time <laughs> and had to face this, this, this inquisition the following day in a way that I, 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 I mean, I was, I mean, when I was at school, um, you know, I got into Doctor Who when I was like eight or nine, ten, and I very much kept it to myself. You know, uh, it was it was only with I was just too late to appreciate the Renaissance of Doctor Who as something that you could talk about openly with uh, with Christopher Eccleston series and onwards. That came out when I was uh, uh, sort of I left school and I was at college. So I just missed out and I just thought, I'm so glad that there are children who are going to be able to grow up enjoying Doctor Who, who can talk about it. In, and it's it's cool. And all the other kids are watching it too. And they can actually have a great time with Doctor Who and not get, you know, attacked by the bullies for it. Like like what I did growing up. So I think that's a, a huge thing. You, you As a child, you want your show to be serious and important. And sometimes the best way to be serious and important is to be very, very silly or to be silly on the surface, like the Happiness Patrol which is ludicrous, but has some very serious messages. And the mm. ending with, uh, with, with Helen A 
you know, crying, the doctor looking over her and the camera panning back is is an amazing sort of final confrontation with the villain. There's nothing else quite like that in in TV Doctor Who. But, you know, if you're yeah, seven... And the, and the blues, and the blues going through too. Absolutely, yeah. The, the, um, the, the thing with me, though, is that when this was shown in Australia, it was shown at uh, 5.30 in the afternoon on as part of a magazine-style program called The Afternoon Show. And the presenter, uh, James Valentine, all us uh, fans of our vintage Philip remember James Valentine. He hated the Sylvester McCoy era. In fact, I don't think he had much time for Doctor Who at all anyway. No, but when Doctor season Who. 24 came on, he would rip into it after the end of every episode. And in particular, the Happiness Patrol episode one, I remember the credits finishing, the camera shot going back to James Valentine and he was just shaking his head with his eyes closed and going, what is going on here? And my dad was there with me too watching it and he was laughing. So I had this yeah. feeling of complete embarrassment and shame over the top of me over this brilliant show that had, that I, you know, I was hugely devoted to in my own mind and my own life. And it, it had kind of been reduced to this um so it was it, it really it really stung for a long time but uh my, happiness, my, my experience with the happiness with patrol was the opposite mm. because you know my parents always hated doctor who couldn't understand why i watched it but my mother walked in during the second episode and went are they making fun of maggie, maggie thatcher because she hated maggie thatcher and so she immediately picked up on what was going on and the, and, and the performance and she went oh well yeah good to see the doctor's doing something useful then <laughs> so yeah, my 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 experience is the opposite because my parents really loved the fact that they were being political and having a go. That seems to be that we've all got. I think we've all got sort of parents figuring very much in the early Doctor Who memories because I got into Doctor Who. My my mum watched it as a child and she grew up with like Troughton and Pertwee and early Tom, and it was just we were watching I can't remember, some other programs and then uh, we were having a chat afterwards and then. Tom Baker's title sequence came on and she said, oh, this is, oh, Doctor Who, I used to watch this with, with your uncle when we were kids. Oh, I think you'd like it. It's, you know, it's, about, it's quite funny. He's got monsters and this clever alien travels in time. And okay. And it was Robot Episode 2. And I watched it and loved it. And then the next day, you know, there's a cliffhanger at the end. He's going to be killed by a robot. And the next day was Episode 3. So I had to tune in to watch it. And I loved it. But it's very much like that. Um, I think if I'd been watching and Doctor Who came on, my mum said, oh, this was rubbish. I hated this. I probably would never have bothered to watch it. But that's a formative thing. I can imagine if you're watching something and then your father behind you starts laughing in a slightly de mocking way. I can imagine. I can imagine that being lacerated on your heart. That's that's quite. That's a that's a huge memory, especially if the. It sounds very unprofessional conduct for a presenter on the television to be going. Oh, I hate this. That's God, Lord. I'm surprised they allowed it, but hey. Oh, it's the ABC. You've got to be unbiased. <laughs> <laughs> um, as as far as audio goes probably one that i found a little confusing to start with but now it's one of my favorites of all time would have to be zagreus um when at the time that it came out it, it, i've been through this before on the show how uh, we we talked to gary russell about it last yeah. year as well for the anniversary and um yeah it was a, it was a strange one to start with but when you go back and revisit it i love it more and more every time i listen to it and i get more out of it every time it's one of those ones i can just keep going back to when i've got about 10 hours to spare because it's that long um but yeah I, I i love that one but dale watts here in the comments says about audio he said maybe live 34 was uh, he says he hated it the first time but loved it the second time then thought it was just okay the third time so he hated it liked it went back a bit um so he's probably cancelled himself out he says i think i was probably in the mood uh I, it was the mood i was in each time it seemed corny on first listen and really clever the next it's probably both and live 34 is an example of what you know and big finish doing experimentation and i thought from uh, it's been years since i've heard it and i've i've been many to go back and listen to it again but i love that kind of uh experimentation that big finish does zagreus was similar um and uh the natural history of fear those kind oh, of experimental yeah. stories are mm. uh are, are really good too so uh philip did you have any audios that because because we've talked about some that we've we've gone into randomoids episodes and you've gone oh i don't think i like i like this one and then you listen to yeah. it again and you get more out of it 
I keep being surprised how often I do go back and listen again and go, oh, actually, that's much better. Live, Live 34, I, I, I didn't enjoy much the first time, but I had a okay. re-listen recently. And I, I did all the, um, doing all the Ace and Hex stories. And so re re-listened on that, listened through, and actually, I really enjoyed it. It was actually a lot cleverer than I thought. The other one that I like, that I still lots of people don't like, is the one sitting out of Beezer. Uh, oh, the Rapture. Party. Yeah, the Rapture. The Rapture. And the Rapture, the first time I listened to that, didn't enjoy it at all. And then went back and listened to it again a couple of years later, and again more recently. And actually, every time I listen to that, I find more in that that I like. There's a, there's a lot of stuff on the side which doesn't quite feel canon. But you know, I think they're experimenting too far. But I actually really like what they've done characterization-wise, and that that always appeals to me. But yeah, I keep being surprised by you know, I, I do I pull faces when we pull some things out randomly, and then go back and listen again with with a different mindset because I'm listening to you know see what I can get out of this and you know make notes, and suddenly there's a lot more in it. I think often we can listen too quickly and in an unprepared way, and you've got to remember these are plays, and I think we often forget. It's not just throw on podcast, though our podcast is fantastic. It's not just throw on podcast and do the do the washing up and wander around the house. They're, they're written as plays, and some in particular, the language. And if you don't stop and prepare, you know, when you walk to a theatre, you walk in, you sit down, the lights dim, you're prepared for what's about to happen, which could be anything. I think sometimes I just stick something on the headphones and keep doing my, going my merry way, and I just miss too much. So when I actually go back and actually give it the effort it deserves, the time it deserves and the space it deserves, I get a lot more out of it. Yeah. And it's, it's that, it's that magic 101 to 200 in the monthly range, isn't it? That we've, that we kind of, we'd, we'd had enough in our big finish catalog where we, you know, we'd listen to the first hundred over and over again, but the, by that stage, we're only listening to them once uh, because they were coming out more regularly and there were, yeah. you know, spinoffs and things like that as well. So going back to that 100, the, right. the 100 mm. to 200 always surprises me. Yeah. No, he's, Sorry, he's David. Doc, no, it's, it's going to be Doctor who ideally should be a very broad church of, of styles and tones. And I think right, those experimental ones, um, like I think he, I think like, like the Rapture and uh, Natural History of Fear and some of these own shirts, so these are these stories which um, when I first heard them, I, I think, again, I got into Big Finish probably in my, I think in my mid-teens, I think I, I was around about that. I think it was in my early to mid teens. And my first one was Storm Warning and sort of went on oh. um, there, picking them up when I could because, you know, didn't have too much money. But I bought them here and there, especially those early McGann's. I mean, I remember when Zagreus came out and I tried to listen to as many McGann's as I could in preparation for it. But those, the experimental ones are, you know, I just so I'm just so glad they exist. You know, they're lots of fun. Mm. Like the you know the rapture in some areas, I'm sure it isn't. You know, it's very different from other stories. But it's one which I listened to and thought, you know what, aspects of this maybe I do differently or whatever. But this is it's a very brave and original storyline tackling sort of themes that hadn't really been done much in Doctor Who at that time. And certainly, pre, it feels very new series. Of course, you know, in sort of its sensibilities, it's doing a lot of things um, before the other uh, new series have come along and said, "Oh, we could actually do a lot of these other sort of themes as well and delve into sort of depression and anxiety and that kind of thing." Um, I remember sometimes, I'm trying to think because you know, uh, many of the the writers of Big Finish I, I see and have socialised with. But let's attack. Um, let's take um, let's take Rob Shearman because Rob Shearman has been you know, fantastic stories. He's only done like what half a dozen or so for a big finish and they're all fantastic but i remember listening to i think it was uh jubilee the first time round uh, in my sort of early teens listening to it not quite getting it and because i was a teenager and not therefore not a sensible person and because i had rob shearman's email address i thought i'd i'd email rob shearman to say <laughs> I, I just listened to jubilee and i just thought you know, um, it was very long and um, I didn't really quite understand so, but I really like this bit. And I sort of, I remember talking about the, the bit of this entirely huge, layered, rich, complex, deep story about sort of propaganda and time and, 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 and the way that we sort of uh, reconceptualize sort of evil and then mock it and then become it and distort and all this. The bit I got out of it at that time was, I think there's a scene where the doctor yells at the Dalek and says, once you've exterminated everything and there's nothing left, what will you do? And for some reason, I thought that was the, the most sort of uh, sort of you know, profound moment. And I said that to Rob Shearman. I remember sort of saying being, you know, in that way that only a blithe teenager can, being entirely dismissive of the other themes of that story and going, yeah, I didn't really understand all the stuff about blah, 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 but I really like this bit and sent it off. And to his credit, I have seen Robert Shearman 
um, a few years ago and uh, uh, met him properly the first time. He had a wonderful chat. He's an absolutely lovely, lovely, mm-hmm. supportive, talented, witty man. And uh, fortunately, he had no recollection <laughs> of that, I'm sure, <laughs> irritating email that Teenage David sent him. And I'm very glad of that because Jubilee is a fantastic, utterly wonderful story. But yeah, the first time I got it, I just went, oh, I don't know. These other people seem to think it's brilliant, but I don't. So I'm going to tell them. And I go, that, no. No, I'm deeply embarrassed by that. Deeply embarrassed. But um, I thought I'd leap on one of these, the absolute classics, ones that, one, an unassailable classic, um, rather than sort of you know, give one of the experimental ones a, a bit of a kicking, because I thought, you know, Jub- Chimes, actually, Chimes of Midnight. Brilliant, brilliant story. Yeah. First time I listened to that, I didn't understand the plot or the time paradox stuff. And I went, oh, I don't like that. Well, and I now <laughs> I obviously I listen to it and go, on, what are you talking about? Of course it's brilliant. It's rich and moody and exciting and funny and yeah it's 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 odd i say how you how they hit you whether you were sat down fully prepared and immersed in it or whether you were really thinking about something else and you missed something you've really got to you know devote a fair bit of attention to them to pick up on these details especially with those really rich stories with experimental ones that do something unusual Um, yeah absolutely let me run through a few more comments we've um uh I'll, i'll run through them reasonably quickly now for for the sake of time but we got a bit of a novel from our, our friend Will Hadcroft, yeah. who um, who uh, joined in on the conversation. Will um, has uh, released an audio story on BBC Audio called "The Resurrection Plant." Um, that was a couple of years ago. Now I think he's got another one on the way. Uh, I think uh, you have to correct me if I'm wrong. Will Will uh, he says I have several. I agree with Kieran regarding Kinder at age eleven and three quarters very precise will i was struggling with the departure of tom baker and the fact that peter davison was playing the doctor like an ordinary human being i was unnerved by tegan in the dark realm and those strange characters but thought the story extremely boring for the most part now though i appreciate the concepts of the need to eliminate egotism and divisive ambition and how human nature goes through cycles on my last viewing i was struck by the serenity of hindle and Sa- sanders having been pushed uh, by the kinder to breaking point and how they advised Earth not to proceed with colonization, an extremely thoughtful and considered script. And I'm with Alex on Delta and the Bannermen. On broadcast, I was 17 and heavily preoccupied with whatever they do next will either make it or break it. So Sylvester McCoy's initial Buster Keaton inspired performances left me dismayed. And Andrew Cartmel, in my eyes, had refreshed the series style in entirely the wrong way. Delta did nothing to reassure me. I found much of it embarrassing, but years later, when I was suffering with depression, a friend recommended watching it because it's light in tone. I did so and was delighted by most of it. I was chuckling away at the two hopeless American spies and noted how some aspects, like the Navarino, seemed to point forward to 2005 in the RTD era. Finally, for years, I believe Ghostlight was all gloss and no substance. I thought the cast, sets and costumes were splendid, but the script was incoherent gibberish. The public would reject it and the series would be cancelled for sure. I was so relieved when Fenric followed it. However, after watching an interview with Andrew Cartmel detailing the ideas behind it, I found my rewatch very absorbing and intriguing. I still think the script doesn't clearly explain the relationship between Josiah, Light and Control, but having heard Cartmel talk about it, I see it and appreciate it. So thanks, Will, for that um, extensive comment. Um, Lots of... Lots of Sylvester McCoy getting mentioned uh, in this in this topic today. Um, Steve Panozzo says, uh, weirdly, all the stories I despised, I pretty much feel the same about today. None <laughs> of them have redeemed themselves in the fullness of time. Shoddy performances, poor production values and crap sets, if anything, look worse with the passage of time. Where I've changed my mind is in misjudging Enemy of the World based on what it was until recently, the lone surviving episode. In viewing the story in its entirety, I went from being rather dull and it went from being rather dull and unremarkable to being one of the top adventures of the Trout era. I used to be rather ambivalent towards Invasion of the Dinosaurs, but that was out of ignorance of having listened to fan advice rather than see it for myself, which I did much later. So I, echo, I have to echo the comments on Enemy of the World when that was uh, found. That was an amazing piece of television. Yeah. One of the most amazing, exactly. like not just Doctor Who, but 60s television across, across the board, I think. Um, you know, it was up there with, you know, what the Avengers was doing and they were throwing lots of money at their production too. 
Mm. So, um, so I have to, I have to agree there. And now our, our good friend, Teresa, uh, Philip says that, uh, the first time I've watched time and the Rani, there you go. And what another seventh doctor, I thought it was nonsensical and confusing, which almost made it unwatchable for me. But then I rewatched it and I realized there were some things that weren't too bad. I realized Sylvester McCoy was a great actor in his first role as the doctor. Kato Mara's impersonation of Mel, which was funny. Kef McCulloch's incidental music was pretty good. That's one way of describing it, Teresa. Um, and I love the design of the Lacertians. I don't mind the plot. Interesting concept. The only letdown was Mel's screams. I've got to admit they got to me a little bit too. But um, as there's a little bit more conversation in that thread uh, on that question too about the fact that it was originally supposed to be a six doctor story. It was offered to Colin Baker to come back and do. He refused. So the seventh doctor was sort of jammed in there into the story uh, a lot of things were changed during that time so um the seventh doctor he was quite redeemed i think over the years in a lot of people's eyes yeah, i i think that the seventh doctor suffered from fear of cancellation i think because i think after the colin baker hiatus um what a bizarre word that only doctor who fans use hiatus yes like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> only doctor who fans ever use that word anyhow um I think when Doctor Who came back, every Doctor Who fan was in panic of the show being cancelled forever. Mm. And so I think I think everyone judges those four years really harshly and they're looking at everything in a minute detail. And I so I think that you know, Collins, the Collins, the Trial of Time Lord and the Sylvester Seasons really get judged differently because is this gonna be is this gonna end Doctor Who forever? And I think that you know, we went through going through that fear of what will, what will everyone think? Will the BBC cancel the show next? I think it, we judged we we judged that at the time, and still maybe a bit do really harshly. Now now it's come back and it's safe. We're happy, but we were living in fear at the time of cancellation, and I think that we judged the show as a lot more because of that. I think there's I yeah, think... the, 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 the con you know, said the context of and I, I always find there are a lot of things which are even some Doctor Who stories that I watched and didn't like initially, when I returned to later, I enjoyed much more because you could put it into a, into a context, which is, if this isn't the version of the show that's on right now or the version that's done, you know, it's a, uh, you know, you can look back on any Doctor's era and go, if you like a story, or don't like a story, it doesn't make any difference to what it's doing right now because it's now safely in the past and you can appreciate things for what they are trying to do and how they're different from the things around them as opposed to it being the version of the show which is on right now, therefore the de facto version. It's got to be perfect in every way. It's got to not only be perfect for the, the British viewing public and the international viewing public, it's also got to be perfect for me and everything I specifically want the show to be doing. And if it isn't, I. But once it's in the background, you can pick up a story that you might not have liked and go on, oh, it's it's Doctor Who doing that. Fair enough. And appreciate what it's doing on those on those scores. It's, I remember you at the beginning mentioned um, uh, the Capaldi era, which I remember watching, thinking that uh, Matt Smith's Doctor was uh, one of, is still my favourite. I loved Matt Smith. Absolutely fantastic. And I think I had the very sort of first twinge of what Doctor Who fans of old used to say when it's like, I love John Pertwee, and then Tom turned up. And I went, oh, what's this? That's a bit weird. So when I adored Matt Smith all the time. Then Capaldi turned up, an actor I loved already. But because the Doctor was now much darker and moodier, and I went, oh, I wasn't, I wasn't certain of some of those Capaldi stories at the time. And then revisited and thought, this is, fat, what was I talking about? This is exceptional television. Like the, the, the sheer layer, the performance, the scripts, it's complex, it's different, it's moody. It might not have been maybe what I, when I first watched what I wanted on that night. Maybe on a sort of Saturday night, I wanted something a bit lighter and peppier and but in the times I've watched the Capaldi era in the context of what it's doing, I thought this is exceptional stuff. We were lucky to have this, this wonderful vision of the show and everyone making it. But that context, I think, is really, really important, especially when mm. it's... I can imagine the Sylvester McCoy era, I think when I was first on Doctor Who forums before the show came back, McCoy bashing and McCoy hating was still a, a thing. It was still a huge way for people who just hated the McCoy era and that's really I, from what I can see disappeared quite frankly mm. and it disappeared quite quickly once the show came back and people appreciated it as its own era and now I think when I see people like I think when season 24 got released on Blu-ray people said oh I won't be buying that time of the Rani I roll and I went oh, is there really a place for this sort of mean spirited it's it's some it's, it's, sold out fast. Very nice, it's fine it's lovely <laughs> television like fine but the idea of 
oh, I hate Time and the Rani, I hate Paradise Towers. I think oh, that's kind of fallen out of favour, hasn't it? It's just it's another era of the show. There are so many mm. eras of the show. They're all got strengths and weaknesses. And if you want light-hearted, light-hearted fun, but full of ideas off the wall, not like anything else you've ever seen before, those four stories of season twenty-four do that. They fulfil that remit of being like nothing else on television before or since. Mm. And it's not even it's certainly not my favourite season, but I can, I, if, if necessary, if a gun to my head, I could put together a defence that says it's the best season of Doctor Who there's ever been. And I'd like to think I could do that for every season. But for that season, that's what I think of season 24. And I'm glad people like it now. And I'm glad people love Delta and the Bannerman. Because it's great. <laughs> Excellent. I think my feeling at the, at the time during that era was not so much the fear of it, of it going, but the disbelief that it could have possibly stopped after season 26 because i thought it was that good yeah. it had improved so much i thought how can anyone possibly cancel it now after there's been such an improvement in my mind but of course we know now that you know the big wigs weren't really paying any attention to it yeah. at all anyway so yeah. that uh throughout the whole time that was going i think uh who was it that said that he thought it was cancelled the whole time <laughs> didn't even know it was on anymore um <laughs> Michael Grade. It was Michael Grade. Michael Grade, said, yeah. He said, didn't it? Wasn't it cancelled? <laughs> yeah. Anyway. All right. That's uh, been a great rabbit hole topic, gentlemen. Thank you very much for, for sharing that with me. Uh, no guns down here in the rabbit hole, so we won't hold anything to your head, David, <laughs> uh, and get you to, to do that. So um, we will jump out of the rabbit hole now and, and talk uh, a bit more in depth to you directly. Uh, but before we do that, we might throw in a trailer for, shall we throw in a trailer for Storm of the Sea Devils, Philip, seeing as that's recent? Okay. Yes, that's fine. I was going to say oh. Dalek, the Dalek occupation winter, but we can do that. One. You can throw that in later. Okay. All right. Let's do that because I love Dalek occupation of winter too. So we must share that with folks. Surgeon Lieutenant Harry Sullivan. Naomi Cross, online from the UK. You're with Unit from Big Finish Productions, the fourth Doctor Adventures, Storm of the Sea Devils. Welcome to Kolkata, Doctor Sullivan. Does the name Ramesh Gamal mean anything to you? The professor. We intercepted a communication from the hotel. Mr. Ramesh Gamal needs a doctor. We thought we'd send him one. Well, well, well. Hello, Harry. Fancy seeing you here. I ask for a doctor and then two turn up at once. What could have caused damage like that? None of us are safe. The creature is here. I've always been fond of reptiles. It's a sea devil. There have been legends of such creatures going back centuries. The professor spoke of more than them living in the swamp somewhere. You're meddling in things you don't understand. Oh, she's right, Kamal. You're staring up a hornet's nest. Our warriors are revived. I will lead the attack. By morning, we will have purified the rivers with human blood. Tell me, have you ever been to other planets? I think you'd rather like them. Here we are, the planet Ereni in the Arfax system. Very remote. Ereni is the premier holiday planet across the entire galaxy. This is the entry portal. Step through here. I've become rather good at spotting virtual worlds over the years. Harry Sullivan! Naomi Cross! Yes, you're Professor Alan Turing. I'm feeling well. I'm all dizzy. Dear me. What have they done to you? No one's coming. Be careful what you wish for, Naomi. Sometimes it proves fatal. I think the air is running out. Sounds like this whole scenario's collapsing. Big finish for the love of stories. Listen, David, it really is great having you with us. Let's let's go back a bit, though. I mean, we've already discovered a lot of stuff about you in the rabbit topic, which is great to hear. But tell us a bit about um, where you were born, where you grew up, what 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 led you to think about writing as a career? Yeah, that's fair. I, so I'm, I was uh, born in the late 80s. I was born uh, in Portsmouth, which is a city on the south coast of England. It's technically an island, a Portsea Isle, but um, yeah, very much a, a sort of a, a naval city. Uh, my dad works and still works in a dockyard as an electrician for the Navy. Um, and I would say you know, I quite early on i got really interested in sort of old television and sort of films mainly through my grandparents um and uh particularly people these sort of wonderful voices um people like you know and we're talking you know 
you know, going quite far back. But yeah, you know, people, actors like James Mason, actors like Kenneth Williams for British uh, 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 listeners um, who did the Carry On films, a wonderful voice. I was, and, and of course, eventually Tom Baker, these r wonderful, rich, sort of characterful voices, which contain so many sort of levels and sort of weird details, which I absolutely loved. And I think it was probably, though I used to write little sort of short comic stories, as children often do, I think it was really Doctor Who that got me interested in writing. Um, the story I, I've said a few times is that, you know, I went to uh, uh, the schools I went to, I went to an, uh, an all boys school, um, not sort of a, a sort of, a, you know, posh school, it's a very ordinary state school, but it was just single sex, all boys sort of school. And, you know, growing up as a child who was pretty clever but not socially adept with thick glasses and who liked books and sci-fi being in a school full of boys who mainly want to sort of bully you is not a great time to be growing up and you know boys being boys especially at that time not always the uh, easiest people to have around and uh, i you know watching you know i was in very much a state of oh who am i what, what what's the future got i don't want to be like them because they're you know very very physical and tough and horrid and unpleasant and then i watched doctor who specifically robot episode two which introduced me to tom baker's doctor who who acted like no adult i'd ever seen in my life um and i think that the scene i always remember is a bit where he's talking to the brigadier and at the end he sort of like gets up on a on a lab bench and just like goes to sleep still fully dressed and the brigadier walks out and i thought i've never seen anyone behave like this in television or real life and i loved it and of course i loved it and i was glued to tom baker's doctor who specifically still my favorite doctor of all though i love all of them tom baker still got that because he was the first one yeah. and i thought that and i thought there there is another way to behave not to do tom baker impressions but you can you know that the idea of a a, a hero and specifically a heroic character who is clever and funny still a bit moody and sort of childish etc who on the whole does not use guns, doesn't shoot people like all the other heroes, the masculine heroes are people who just you know who could shoot the most bad guys and be generally quite unpleasant. Someone who is clever and funny, who wanted to help and a genuinely a heroic figure who was entertaining because it's hard to do heroes. It's very hard to, everyone says the villains get the best lines and I think they often do, but I would dispute the idea that, that those should be the best characters sometimes. I, I really like heroes. I'm very much drawn to heroic characters who are interesting because there aren't many of them, but Tom Baker's Doctor Who was, and Doctor Who generally for every incarnation has been an interesting, heroic, flawed, funny, strange, intelligent character. And I think it was through that, then I got involved in old Doctor Who and then some sort other of things. And I think it sort of, led me oddly into sort of comedy because Doctor Who at its best, I think it's very funny. It's a very yeah. funny show. Tom Baker's Doctor is very funny. And um, but I'm thinking that Russell T Davies and certainly Stephen Buffett and Chibnall, all the, the new series incarnations have grabbed is also, it's got to be funny and it's got to be witty and it's got to be accessible. It's got to be fun and you can be funny and dark and frightening at the same time. And I think that led me into comedy and I did writing sketches and comedies and sort of like quite, rather ambitious shows for the stage but i did write them with lots and lots of actors and i, I went to edinburgh um university of edinburgh and there was a an all uh, there was a, a a student run theater and i was there for six years writing plays no, none of them none of them fit to be staged now they were dreadful but it was a good learning curve of being able to write something give it to actors and see it done and I learned a lot. Mainly, I made lots and lots of mistakes over six years, but that gave me, hopefully got a lot of those out of my system so that when I went on, I mean, a good reason I became a writer is because I wanted to be an actor. Then no one cast me in anything. So I became a writer because there weren't many of them. So I could write my own stuff. I still like acting. I don't do it often, but it was, it was writing. Um, and I went on from there and I came to London, did a few bits and pieces, trying to get into theatre, theatre in London, very expensive, very hard to get into. And then the friends I was with at the time, um, uh, flatmate suggested writing something uh, for uh, a sitcom, for audio, for podcasts. And that got me into that. That did well. And over time, eventually I got picked up by Big Finish and that led me was, there. Was that, Who, uh, was that Wooden Overcoats? It was Wooden Overcoats. Yeah. A, fun uh, a sitcom about rival undertakers in, um, it's, it's a very much a sort of classic British sitcom, but with quite modern sensibilities, which started 2015. And that was really my first, sort of the first thing I did that got noticed by, by anyone, um, totally independently made. Um, 
and we did several seasons of that but being able to have my own sort of world and my own characters and own tone and strange freak and there are lots of doctor who references in it as well but i think doctor who has been one of these things that's been there throughout most of my life um both as a, a tremendous program to watch and be entertained by to have a great sort of ethos in it as well and to read really, i think to pick the sorts of characters and ways of being that i just hadn't seen depicted anywhere else and i think it's great that doctor who's continued to expand and change and, and diversify uh, and say so that's not uh, doctor who doesn't need to be a sort of uh, mid middle-aged white man in a sort of like frock coat it can be so doctor who can be anyone because doctor who should be anyone anyone should be able to be doctor who um, I think it's a tremendous series, and I'm glad it's still on, but it's been a huge part of my development as a writer, as well as just an audience member. Now, capping up on a couple of things in that wonderful summary, um, going back in terms of just doing the maths, you say you were born in the late 80s. How were you seeing Tom Baker? Uh, UK Gold. So this is a TV, ah. yeah, so the TV yeah. channel which did a lot of old repeats and telling many sitcoms, but it did this. And yeah, the Tom Baker stories were repeated. You got every weekday evening they did an episode and it started presumably of robot part one which i missed and went onwards and they also had these sort of omnibus versions omnibuses on the, on the weekend yeah and that's how i also got to see not only later tom because oddly during the weekdays they were doing the doctor who with sarah jane and then i said oh doctor who's on the saturday as well and it was suddenly doctor who and leela i think it was fang rock and i went who's that i what i don't know who this is um there was a documentary, it's called um, More Than 30 Years in the TARDIS, which was yeah. made in the early 90s. That was the first, my mum had said, oh, other people play Doctor Who, and but didn't give any details. That was the first time watching that I realised that Doctor Who was this show, that not, and I think it was great that I caught it in the middle, sort of, with Tom Baker, that it had lots of stuff before it and lots of stuff afterwards. And the idea of this rich story with so many eras and stories and themes and influences and people was absolutely mind-boggling to me. It used to be on in black and white. Really? I didn't know they made television in black and white. Oh, my. it was exciting. And um, so that's and now I got to see Peter Davison and, and Colin and Sylvester. And then it could, jumped back to Hartnell Trout. And so I got to see all of them. So I was pretty well versed in Doctor Who by the time it came back with Eccleston. Um, uh, I didn't see the McGann movie when it came out. I wasn't aware of it at that time. Um, but yeah, I, but it, it was that program which you before Russell T Davies brought it back. It was a sort of the secret shame. You you enjoy Doctor Who, but no, you couldn't tell anyone else at school about it because that was weird. It was a weird, old, creaky sci-fi. Why would you like that? So you just. Kept when did it you yourself. first? When did you first work out there was other people around that liked Doctor Who as well? I think it was. I remember I had a school teacher who her husband was a massive Doctor Who fan, and she kind of realised. I think maybe I had one too many stray references to the Cybermen, but she went. Do you like Doctor Who? And I don't you know. So she went, Oh, my husband loves it, and lent me a few books. They had these sort of reference books. I think um, uh, one was uh, David Banks's book about the Cybermen, I remember. Lots yeah. of good pictures. I had that and a few of these reference books. And, and we, I, I think there were a couple of like collector's fairs on we went in, you know, we bought secondhand videos and all this. And I kind of realized, and then at later sort of college, especially university, one thing I've discovered, and it, it's this. Um, I can understand really in a way that why Doctor Who had a, a huge sort of gay fan base and queer fan base, it's particularly, you know, a time when you, again, there'd all these aspects of yourself that you would sort of keep hidden in your formative years because you didn't want to be looked down on or treated badly. The same way that I think um, gay men often would sort of like sort of recognise that and try to sort of suss that somebody else was. And then sort of, it's the same way a lot of Doctor Who fans, I remember having like episode, you know, my own scripts being performed and there was like a quote from a Doctor Who episode smuggled into it. And then somebody would, in the audience would come up to me after to say, um, that line in that first speech, and I went, yes, he said, Deadly Assassin episode one? And I went, yes, of course, it's the very beginning of Tom Baker. And he said, you're a Doctor Who fan. And they go, yeah, and then you suddenly chat. And I've met a lot of friends through that, actors I work with and writers and all that, who came up to me during a gig and went, hang on, are you? A... And then we would then, I mean, you'll start talking about whether we prefer Philip Hinchcliffe or Graham Williams. Graham Williams for me, David Philip Hinchcliffe for many others. And it just sort of came up. But um, I, I am glad we don't need to do that anymore. <laughs> you can just say, I like Doctor Who. People go, yeah, great. That's Not only to come out of the closet, you can just be out. Fantastic, yes. I mean, yeah, I mean, like, even like, okay, sexually, I only sort of came out as bisexual a few, a few years ago myself. So this sort of like, this sort of so, the so realization of oneself over time. But I'm glad that people don't need to stay in their, in their blue police box closets anymore for Doctor Who. It's a show <laughs> that we can all enjoy. 
Now, my passion for history, I attribute back to Doctor Who because there'd be a historical show on, a book I'd read, I then started doing lots of study. Now, I know you studied ancient history in Edinburgh. I did. Is, is, is history, would you classify Doctor Who as a part of your reason for your interest in I, history? Yeah, I think so. It's just, there are a lot of periods of history which I know of because of Doctor Who. I don't think I'd know about the you know the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre if it weren't for, for Doctor Who. I think Doctor Who kick-started my interest in the Aztecs. Um, I think it kick-started the Romans, certainly ancient ancient Greeks. I loved, um, I had the, the BBC Radio Collection CDs of the 60s stories, uh, which is when I first got to know the enemy of the world which came up earlier uh, was a i love the enemy of the world on cd and i loved it even more when it came back we could see it mm. but the myth makers was my first one narrated by peter purvis and i loved it such a wonderful story and i think these things really did before i'd even read you know homer and sophocles euripides and so on i i, I knew the doctor who versions of these stories and Though I wasn't as keen on the historical stories when I was a young child, as I got older in my teens and I got more interested in history, it was, it was the jumping off point, really was um, the jumping off point for getting interested in lots of bits of history. And I still, I still really, I mean, I really love the stories uh, where they go back in, in time. And I even like the, the new series ones. I know it's very rare, I don't think they've ever done a pure historical, but I still like going nipping back and going to ancient rome or venture van gogh or whatever I, there's this there's just something very exciting about oh i know that bit oh i read that book and here we're doing it they're yeah some of my favorites i think i gravitate more towards the the historical stories than the the future sci-fi ones but yeah, yeah. how did, how was it the playwriting became your default for writing you, have you always was, had a passion for theater yeah I, I think it was because it was the option available um to me like i um i think before i got to the theater i had no particular I'd, I'd done a bit of acting on stage as a child but I, I hadn't really any particular uh feeling that i go into theater but it was you know i went to edinburgh and they had a theater the bedlam theater it's still run now still run by students um entirely and you know and so you know you, you go in and you're maybe in your first year and maybe you'll be helping to run it by the time of your last year. So it's a wonderful, wonderful institution. A lot of actors and writers and directors and, and production and technicians and it have, have got their start in Britain there. Um, and it's uh, I, I just I wanted to write. I wanted to tell stories, mainly comedies. And I thought, well, I'm not going to get on television certainly no time soon. But the theatre is there and I could work with people. That's the first time I got to work with other creatives and and swap ideas and that was very very exciting and i would have probably carried on doing theater when i got to london if only but not for the fact that it is the the rents on theater spaces are very very high it costs a lot of money to take something to the edinburgh fringe which is one of the big arts festivals here where you can get your work seen and and and, and staged and maybe picked up it's very very expensive very expensive to get a, a play on here and it's becoming more and more expensive every passing year and i don't believe if 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 the economic situation was now what it was when i first moved to london i don't think i would have done any theater at all but then audio opened up as a a, a possible avenue uh, and podcasting um, was starting to really 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 rev up particularly in, in the uk and fiction shows scripted fiction in about 2014, 15, 16, that was a huge boom of scripted fiction shows and audio as people also realised, oh, here's an opportunity, an avenue that I, a writer who may not have had any experience or only a bit of experience or whatever, can now create something and make it and distribute it internationally. And maybe no one will listen to it, but it will be out there and people could listen to it. And that was a very, very exciting time. Um, again, now it's very, very difficult to get a, a new podcast notice especially a scripted one but then you could have these independent companies sprung up creating new shows and that's when i created wooden overcoats with with some friends and, and we went on to do that and many of those people i still work with today um you, we, we got together we, we wrote a you know we wrote a show eight episodes with other writers and then we produced it and we had a huge cast of wonderful actors and we recorded it and made it as professional as we could you know and and, and we released it and it did quite well um, and went on for several years and got me noticed and got me work. But I think those avenues are so important. Those avenues where you can get into an art form without any prior experience or limited experience. It's how you then get people who go on to do the, you know, the, the award winning TV shows, huge plays, wonderful radio series, Oscar winning films. If you don't have those avenues, you don't get those artists and you don't get that art. 
So mm. without a student theatre, without podcasting, I I would probably not be here speaking to you now. I certainly wouldn't have had anything produced uh, professionally and released commercially. It just wouldn't have happened. Now you went on to produce have that. I think Cry Havoc was your next yeah. piece of work. That was, an, yeah, that was a, a company called uh, Rusty Quill, another of those big independent um, companies that uh, their best known show is the Magnus Archives. It now has a sequel series, The Magnus Protocol, which has millions and millions and millions and millions of, of, of fans and listeners worldwide. Um, and that was a show about ancient Rome, which I'd wanted to do for a while. Um, as a 20 part series taking the fall of Julius Caesar and the rise of Mark Antony as a, as a comedy. Um, a bit spikier than Wooden Overcoats had been. But again, and I'm sure you know, though in my head, in you know, I, Claudius is a series I loved. Derek Jacobi and John Hurt, that British 70s series. You know, I'm sure my love of ancient Rome probably started with finally sitting down and watching Hartnell's The Romans and actually getting it and enjoying mm -hmm. it. Um, but and by Cry Havoc, I think it was, I, I'd started writing for, you know, other series and I'm a script editor for Audible as well. And I'm working on a few things. I've just had my first BBC radio play recorded um a few weeks ago and that's going out in august um it's only taken that sort of it's eight or nine years of working in audio to get my first bbc commission but i got it and it's there and then hopefully they'll, they'll give me some more but um i think it was during 2017 wooden overcoat season three i was working on when david richardson um, invited me to write my first big finish um quite out of the blue um i've been recommended by john dorney um, who I've known for many, many, many years prior. And I got this email from David Richardson saying, hello, um, would you like to write a Doctor Who? Um, uh, we'd like something for the first Doctor, Stephen and Vicky, and we'd like you to do something a bit different with the Daleks. Would, would you like that? And as somebody who would, wasn't expecting this, to be asked not only to write Doctor Who, and also the first Doctor is one of my favourites, but also could you do something with the Daleks? I thought, yes, of, of course I'd love to do that. Why, why are you even... Why even asking? Of course I'll do that. I'd love to do that. And I started writing my first Doctor Who um, in 2017, about a few months after I just left my job to pursue full-time writing, which for much of the time meant full-time unemployment, but <laughs> slowly built up. But that was one of the things. Was one, I think that was my first... Actually, yes, The Dalek Occupation of Winter was my first commissioned uh, work. First first piece of work I had which wasn't self-generated. It was somebody paying me money to write a thing for them. And that was my very first commission from David Richardson, my first commission in my career. Yeah, and I can say it's a pretty spectacular first commission work. Um, I must confess I, I haven't listened to the other two podcasts and actually just, can, can we access the previous work? Can we actually access them somehow? The previous oh, absolutely, things? yes. Um, oh yeah, uh, Wooden Overcoats and Cry Havoc uh, are both available on any podcast app. Um, okay, just, just so search. They're, all, they're freely available. Um, the entire series of shows are up there for free. And so any podcast app will allow you. Wooden Overcoats has a nice big blue logo with two coffins on it. Um, yeah. I listened to a bit that. on Spotify today. Yes, we're on Spotify. Yeah, absolutely on Spotify. I think actually Wooden Overcoats is currently, we've just joined a, a network called the Fable and Folly Network, which is a wonderful uh, home of a lot of fiction, scripted fiction shows and i believe i think in a few days um our feed is switching uh, my producer has gone back and kind of remastered some of the earlier seasons so they should all sound even better than before so that's happening this week but um yeah all available you can find them on your phone and they cost nothing brilliant i will go and listen to some of them because i'm curious to hear some more of your work oh you were right doctor it's cold yes well of course it's cold it's snowing oh dear 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 Coming soon from Big Finish Productions. Doctor Who, The Early Adventures, The Dalek Occupation of Winter. Where are we, Doctor? The ship doesn't appear to know, my dear. Whatever this planet is, it's on the edge of the galaxy, and its icy temperatures make it inimical to civilized life. Once again, we gather on this day in our calendar to not only celebrate the achievements of our finest academy of young people, but also to recognize the hopes and dreams that shall be carried forward within them. Doctor, he's talking as if the graduates will never be seen again. Why does the graduate not step forward? Out of my way! That's my brother! Identify yourselves! Then 
The Dalek must have personal access to the leading figure of the city, and therefore this planet. It doesn't bode well, does it? Dalek forces must be replenished. City productivity must increase by 5%. These Daleks, where are the insides? Stephen! Even greater than I'd imagined. Big Finish. We love stories. Majorian! Oh, hello again, Mr. Ambassador. Nuts. Now, let's go back to uh, Dalek Occupation of Winter. Um... So David Richard is contacting you at the blue. So how do you know John Dorney as an actor or as a writer or I I know him because I used to be on a yeah I, I used to know him on a, a Doctor Who forum called I think it was Outpost Gallifrey back way right. back in the day um, and he was on there as Dorney and so he was a person who I knew from Doctor Who I've I've got a lot of friends I've made through Doctor Who forums who I then went on to be flatmates with or colleagues with and, and uh, Dorney was. Uh, he was an actor and he came up a few times at the Edinburgh Fringe and we met each other up for a drink to say, oh, yeah, I know you from the Doctor Who forum. Met up that way. And I think I remember him saying, oh, I've just had my first big finish acting gig, which I think was a McGann called Faith Stealer. I think Faith Stealers. Few, yeah. yeah. He had a few. Whoops, be praised. Roles, wasn't it? Yes. That's the, yeah, and he had a few roles in that. And then over time, he suddenly was uh, also writing and because uh, he's a tremendous, tremendous writer. I do think John Dorney is one of the hardest working writers I've ever met, certainly one of the most talented writers I've ever met for this facility for not only coming up with wonderful ideas and telling them in such intelligent ways, but for doing it so damn quickly. You know, the man is an absolute machine, but, uh, you know, but but still, churn, you know, coming out, I was going to say churning out because he does it so quickly, but actually every single script he writes is just filled with magic and wonder and life. He's a tremendous writer, absolutely wonderful writer, a tremendous editor as well. And um, I think he had... You know, I had a couple of seasons of wooden overcoats under my belt by, you know, 2015, 2016, 17. And I think he'd recommended me as he had several writers to um, David Richardson. And um, in the end, I think they went, oh, yeah, he's, yeah, OK, we'll try him out, see see what, see how he does. And I just grabbed it. I, I absolutely loved writing that script. Um, made lots of mistakes, of course, as you do on your first one. The, 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 out, the first outline I sent them was like 20 pages. And they said, could it be two? I went, oh, yeah, sure. And then that story didn't quite work. And we changed the story quite a bit in those outlines. And then the script I wrote was like, I think the story is two and a half hours. It's meant to be 100 minutes. Uh, and I think they said, OK, this is going a bit over. This is your first one, so we'll allow that. And the material is very good. But in, in the future, could you make sure the episodes are 25 minutes, not 45? And yeah, absolutely, of course. But I, I loved writing that. That, that story it just it allowed me to do things which I hadn't done before, but still get a bit of comedy in there. But the, the darkness and and the the the, the themes of exploitation, the exploitation of younger people, exploitation of entire society, the idea that you could be doing something that's contributing to disasters and horrendous things happening elsewhere and be totally unaware of it. And what the weird morality of that is, they're all things I just sort of wanted to play with and see what would happen. And I think the Hartnell era is particularly well suited to those morally grey stories, um, mm. even though the audience was probably at their youngest the Hartnell era, some of those stories are very dark. And, you know, a, a show that can go from giant ants one week to suddenly doing the, the Crusades the next in quite a nuanced fashion. Like, mm. you know, a series that will give you that, uh, that, convers that yelled conversation, that yelled argument between King Richard and Joanna in episode three of the Crusade. It, it, and somebody's gone, I, have you forgotten this is for children? They've gone, I don't care. It's great drama. And they just released it. That, that's an era that can do anything. The yeah. Hartnell era. So writing a story set there with all that nuance. I'm sorry. I, mean, I know I'm just going on and spewing stuff at you and just talking and talking. But I loved, I loved writing that script. I'm so glad people enjoyed it. Yeah. No, you gave it four episode titles. Very yep. uh, typical with the... Were you asked yeah. to do that or you just did that yourself? We, yeah, we were asked. They to. said, yeah, they said, because it's a Hartnell story, uh, could you give us some titles as well for those? And I went, yeah, absolutely. So I quickly came up with those. Um, I also, I, I can't remember what it was. I did give a, an episode title for 
Daughter of the Gods, the one episode which is set sort of with, which is led by Hartnell. The script said, can we have the Hartnell theme music and here's the episode title. But I think they, I think they just used the Trouty music. But I did have, I can't remember what it was. I had an episode title for episode two of Daughter of the Gods, just to make sure it was properly Hartnell worthy. Um, I cannot remember, cannot remember what it was. But uh, I thought, yeah, we, we need to, there are certain, you want to make the stories broader and deeper and all the rest of it. But there's certain things you've got to do. There's certain things you have yeah. to do. A Dalek must say exterminate. Hartnell episodes need their own titles. Up until, of course, with the savages. And then you do. Of course. <laughs> so John Dorney, did he do much? He was the script editor for your first piece of work. Did he, yeah. was, how much did you have to collaborate with him? How much work, how much did he reject and throw back at you? Or was it a pretty easy it, process? It was, yeah, I think, um, he the main thing was just sort of cutting it down to a manageable length and knowing how much you can put into an episode and then david richardson was also quite involved um i think it was uh bits of it i i, I actually i remember the bits um originally a lot of the story revolved around a hospital where i think people were maybe being turned into daleks or turned into something they, a lot of it was about a hospital and they said this is good could we give you notes tomorrow? And I said, oh, why is that? And said, because tonight is a new Capaldi episode called Well Enough in Time. And we think there might be a bit of crossover, but let's see. And then, of course, the episode came out and it was a lot of it set in a hospital with Cybermen. And they went, yeah, this is a bit too similar. Can we get rid of the hospital? And I went, well, at least I'm working on similar lines to Stephen Moffat. You know, there, there's, there's something good there. You know, it's well done. It just got there rather late in a different medium. But um, I think there's a, could we get rid of the hospital? How about could we have like a lab? like a lab, sort of like, you remember the genesis of the Daleks or the Doctors surrounded by little horrible squiggly things. What about a lab with squiggly mutants in it? I went, yeah, great. That sounds really cool. And so that's where that subplot, I think where Vicky um, uh, uh, is in, turns up. But much of the rest of it was quite, once the story was kind of set and I knew what I wanted, um, Dorney is a very good, he's a great editor. He is very sympathetic to what you're trying to do. He knows exactly how a four part story is going to work. He knows exactly how you can make it different because he often tries to innovate and experiment with his scripts. Um, and he sort of pushes you, to, you know, you say, look, I know these lines sound good, but they don't actually make any sense. Could you change them or cut them? And you go, yeah, of course, <laughs> you're right. <laughs> and then you do that. He's a, he's a wonderful collaborator, a, a terrific talent, um, John Dorney, and I've, I've done a number with him. But um, I think the main note I remember for Dalek Occupation was, he said, the characters are drinking quite a lot. There's a lot of people who seem to be drinking brandy. You'd realise that by this stage, they'd be paralytic. Uh, also, this is partly, we, we have to sort of go by BBC mandates. So can, you, can you cut all the references to drinking and alcohol, except for maybe one or two, where they're dramatically justified? And I went, oh, OK, sure. And I think some violence got cut. I think it was a bit more violent. There, was a, there were probably a few Eric Saywardisms in there, which got cut, because they said, uh, you can't have the chief of security, like, you know, punch the doctor in the stomach. It's William Hart that would be sad. So... She can threaten him. So then I said, I said, okay, I'll get rid of that. And then I, I think I replaced it with something much nasty. Originally, she, you know, he was beating up. And I went, okay, we can't do that. And I went, all right. And I wrote the scene where she sort of threatens to torture him with a Dalek sort of fire, the sort of pyro flame, fire um, flame thrower, which I think is much, much nastier. Of course, she doesn't actually use it on him, but she threatens him with it. I think it makes for a much nastier and more frightening scene than the one I'd originally written. So I loved that note. Because they said, oh, can we make it less violent? And I said, absolutely. And I just made it much more frightening. <laughs> <laughs> now, did you get to go into the recording? Yes, I met uh, 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 Peter Purvis and Warren O'Brien and, and the actors, uh, Sarah Powell and all the Robert Dawes, all the actors. And I was there for, I think, the second day. And um, again, it was, it was just an absolute pleasure. It was Lisa Bowerman directed mm. that. And, you know, for my first recording for Big Finish, very warm, very welcoming. The actors are very nice about the script and, and and peter maureen both said oh we love this one this is this is really really good you know getting to do all this you know morally gray stuff and it's really frightening and political and uh, and, and it was a huge huge fun and i, I also got to enjoy one of those uh, once legendary sort of big finish lunches where they had these tremendous sort of free course meals made by people who worked there um and yeah it was tremendous just to sort of hear it being done and you you learn so much as a writer from watching actors work and seeing what lines that might have sounded great in your head just fud in, in in context and then hopefully you can jump in and suggest alterations or lines that actors visibly don't like or the lines they visibly do like and the scenes that they're enjoying as opposed to the scenes that they're doing because they're being paid to be there and ideally you're going to try and do more of the former you want you know i was the one of the 
responsibilities of a writer really is try not to think about the audience nor the stuff you can't control just write dialogue that the actors are looking forward to doing at work um, and if you can do that there's a good chance the whole thing will be better and more energetic and hopefully the audiences will like it as well so you just do that so just focus on what the actors are doing and watch what they're doing how they're doing it what bits they're enjoying what bits they're struggling with um, and always be on a hand to if if asked to present alternatives i mean they don't want you to just quickly jump in on the mic and go i've got a new line because that throws people off but if the director turns to you and says could we have an alternative on that you just go yes and you do it because everyone's trying to do a good job everyone's trying to do the best work they can on that day and your job is to try and help them to do it so by being in the recording i think is very important for a writer if they can attend and if they're invited hmm. now after doing a amazing first doctor show two months later your next script comes out. I know it took a couple of months to write in yes. between and be recorded. But from the first Doctor, you go to fly all the way to the brand new era of Doctor Who and a unit story. Yes. So how did how did the decision get made that you, they're going to throw you in the deep end with a, a brand new new series story? I think John must have just recommended me to, to Matt Fetton, who's an absolutely an sort of, uh, absolute demon in terms of um, productivity and how many plates he can spin. Um, you know, wonderful chap to work with. Um, and yeah, I just got this email saying, oh, uh, John said you did a good job in this Dalek one. Would you like to do a, a, a unit script? And at first I thought, oh, I don't know, because it felt so different. I had never done anything, you know, this sort of contemporary action thriller type genre. And I thought, I don't know if I can actually do that. I've no idea how. But, um, you know, he sent me, I said, could I read a few of the, I hadn't heard them at that time. So could you send me a few scripts or audios and he sent me I think the sil the silenced set and a few scripts and I saw I read them and tried to get my head into it and I thought well I think what I can do is come up with an interesting dramatic situation and I don't think I can probably write as much of the charging around kicking down doors stuff I wouldn't know where to start but maybe if I could come up with a situation where they're all at unit HQ and every one of the of the cast has a different perspective on a difficult situation and so that's when I came up with this sort of refugee story I suppose of this um, I think it was like a, a, a sort of a flea I think it was like an alien sort of queen I think with her daughter and then a, 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 um, a sort of battle fleet comes to reclaim them as, uh, as political prisoners and uh, and then they said well I've, we should either hand over these people who we barely know or else they'll destroy the planet but also handing people over is totally alien to our you know totally against our ethos and code of conduct and it sounds like a terrible awful thing to do how do we get get out of the situation and um i really in the end enjoyed writing that and again going to that recording and one thing i realized is a, a, a huge benefit that uh, big finish grants to i think especially new writers um is the opportunity not only to have your work made and you know to be uh, professionally commissioned and, and paid but also to work in genres you might not otherwise have ever done um there there is no other there is no other situ, you know scenario in which somebody would come up to me and say hi could you give us a, a a contemporary political thriller action story script based on my background of mainly theater and sitcom no one's gonna ask me that except big finish oddly and then i did it and then i felt much more confident i thought well that's something else i think i could push myself into and the, the drama I've just done for the BBC is a crime thriller, which again, a genre I hadn't done much before, except for the fact I'd done a few big finished Doctor Whos, which had elements of that. And so I felt I had that kind of things I could now call upon. So that the, 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 the tones and styles and genres I feel have been broadened by working through big finish doing Doctor Whos. And again, that's a, it, it, it's an amazing opportunity for new writers to be able to work on the sorts of programmes, the sorts of styles they would otherwise probably never be asked to do, or certainly not be asked to do at that stage of their careers. So that's mm. that tremendous. And so the unit story, I just thought, that came out, like, yeah, as I say, like a month later, despite being written nine months before. And uh, that seemed to go down quite well in that lovely box set with the, the Keller machine and the Wirren. Um, yeah. I think, yeah, so that was, a, that was a, yeah, again, pretty, uh, very exciting. Coming soon from Big Finish Productions. Unit, Volume 7. Greyhound 3 to track 1, do you read? Can't say this is my ideal climate, over. Roger that, Greyhound. It needs must when the devil drives. Parting gifts from the master don't tend to be very good news, especially not gift-wrapped ones with beautifully handwritten notes. 
shall share its fate. Director, welcome to Mundhol. Oh, Seth, it's good to be back. Let's good switch off the power. But why? I said do it now. Vara! For the love of my daughter and my hatred of you. It's trying to tear itself free from the building. It wasn't supposed to be like this. We were bringing people hope. Big Finish. We love stories. Your King Lost experience with writing different styles, do you find that, can you actually use Big Finish well on your CV? Do people outside of Doctor Vandom respect what Big Finish is doing and the writing that you're doing there? How, how does it look on your CV? I think it, I think it depends on, I think the fact, uh, if you're going for sort of audio, um, I think there's always, there tends to be a bit of a professional sort of stigma against licensed properties, which is ludicrous, absolutely ludicrous. When you consider how much culture is run by licensed properties, like, you know, if you were to write a, a Marvel movie, I don't think you'd be trying to hide that. You know, it's a huge, huge deal. Um, but sometimes, I think particularly in Britain, they can go a bit, oh, that's, you didn't create that yourself. You've done that off something else. Sometimes. Other, rather more sort of, uh, 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 I think, probably brighter, brighter sparks will go, ah, oh, you have experience of writing drama in this medium uh, to time. You know, you were presumably uh, set deadlines and specific things you needed to do. And you met those requirements because and I know you did because they asked you back. Uh, so you can not only write yourself, you can write for someone else's voice. And that's a very important skill in, in television and in a lot of, sort of franchises. You need to be able to not only write unique stuff yourself, you often need to write things which sound like the voice of either the lead writer or those characters. These are all tremendous skills which are, are hard to, to refine. And I think writing licensed work, and particularly licensed Doctor Who, which uh, is, um, you know, Big Finish makes a, a lot of stories. They work with a lot of tremendous actors. Every actor in Britain wants to be in a Big Finish because it's tremendous fun. And audio recording is a tremendous fun. You don't need to learn the scripts. You just, you, 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 hopefully you've read them and you've prepared a bit, but you turn up and you meet wonderful actors and you gossip in between scenes and that. And you don't need to put on, you don't need the costumes. You don't need to worry about cameras. You can just focus on the text and the performance and you meet people and it's tremendous fun every actor i've met doing a big finish has been so thrilled to be there because it's a great day out and you get paid to do it um so i think it, it's big finish has a huge place in the ecosystem here in the uk and right now particularly it's you know it was tremendous back when i did my first one in 2017 now you know there, there aren't a huge number of independent companies uh, uh uh slots available on radio and other companies you know it, it, the ecosystem is very very tricky at the moment and has been for several years the fact that big finish has been managed to adapt and continue and do what it does and still provide opportunities for for work for existing writers and new writers is something to really be applauded i think um it, 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 big finish has a tremendous place in the the independent ecosystem here culturally for, for, for artists and actors. Um, I want to keep working chronologically with the order which your stories came out, though I do understand that um, some have slipped in and there's yeah. stories we don't know about. And I know that Tom Bacon's just got released, was yeah. recorded years ago. And yeah. you know, at the moment, I think Tom Bacon, they've got him up to 2030 yes. <laughs> in terms of story. So there's, there's a huge huge stockpile of stories yet to come out and i don't know and i know you can't tell us what are yours and what's going to come so i'll just work with the next one so the next story that you that came out for you was daughter of the gods yes. which was one of the last early adventures maybe the last early adventures that came out yeah and i know people are very excited about this because katarina was coming back yes and and so you've, we've actually got a story with katarina i think it's also yeah. the last story as well which has peter purvis playing the first doctor and Fraser Hines playing the second Doctor before mm. they were having recasts as 
other doctors. So how did the Daughter of the Gods come about? That was so that was yes my third to come out my fourth to write because there is a there was a, a, a Tom Baker in between that has yet yet to be announced, <laughs> which I written and recorded in twenty eighteen. So it's uh, you know it's it's still there. Um, but I did Daughter of the Gods. That was a very difficult script to to write. Um, Compared to Dalek Occupation and, say, Unit, which uh, you know, weren't easy, but I, I sort of felt quite confident and etc. Daughter of the Gods was the difficult one because I was really... I suppose I was... I was it, the, the difficult bit was actually just coming up with a storyline, a storyline that would involve two Doctors, all the companions and everything else. And I just, ke I just kept coming up with these two complex ideas, these huge things, and, you know, I, I, it, it, months had gone by and I still hadn't provided an outline and they David and John are understandably getting a bit worried. And um, I went out for, for coffee with John. And he said, okay, tell me what your ideas are. And I had, you know, I mean, the story I tell is I had this huge watch of documents. It was basically, I had a, my laptop and I said, look, I've got these pages of notes and I don't quite know. He said, okay, you're overthinking it. Think of two or three scenes you really want to write uh, and base the rest of the story around making those scenes happen and simplify it. Like, you know, this, 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 you know, focus on what you want. And I said, well, what I want is to base this on, on Katarina because that's the USP in many ways. I think, you know, you might be able to do other stories with the first two Doctors meet, but you're never going to really do that many of Katarina. So I want to do a story about Katarina. The TV continuity does not allow for any stories with the first Doctor, Stephen and Katarina, because it's all, you know, they all run into each other, those five episodes. Uh, so I, it's going to have to be something a bit different. And I wanted... I didn't want to do the typical multi-doctor story where the doctors team up and they do a bit of banter and then they basically end up sharing lines because you very rarely need more than one doctor in a story for it to work. I wanted, I thought, okay, let's have some conflict. I want um, there to, to be some conflict and maybe it will be about Katarina. And I thought, okay, what if you've got a situation where, Kater where Dalek's Mastermind didn't happen and the first doctor and Katarina and Stephen have managed to spend some months together and then a future doctor turns up and says those months shouldn't have happened and furthermore if we go back to how things should have happened that friend of yours dies you know very very soon after you meet them and you fail her essentially and i thought again the first doctor who's usually portrayed in multi-doctor stories as the knowledgeable one the one that the other doctors will look up to for advice in the three doctors the five doctors i thought well that's not the case he wouldn't be he's the youngest he's technically he's the child he doesn't understand any of this so if you know, if the second Doctor turns up and says this is the way it's got to be, with several hundred years of hindsight, the first Doctor would be, no, oh, I disagree, I don't want that to happen. And I think the first, uh, William Hartnell's performance was often rooted sometimes in this sort of like an old man, but with a childish heart, the way he would suddenly, you know, blow his top and get annoyed and rah, fussy about people. I never saw it as being like a cranky old man, I saw it as being like a child. Um, and so that's why I thought I'm going to root it on that. And I thought, okay, I want a scene where the first Doctor and Katarina have a really nice conversation with each other, which I did in episode two, where it's just where they can actually be a doctor and companion together. And I want a scene where the, the doc, second doctor and the first doctor have a big conflict about Katarina. And I want a scene where the second doctor sits down with Katarina and has a conversation with her and basically gives her some agency in deciding how things are going to work out. And in which Katarina then says, to you honest, you're not giving me a choice at all, are you? You're basically saying, if I don't agree with you, everyone's going to die. This isn't a choice, in fact. and. And I thought, I'm going to have those three scenes, I'll base the rest of the story around it. And then it it came out quite quickly. But those are, I need to have a, I need to have that spine. I need to have those scenes I really want to write, all those themes I want to delve into to, to make a script come to life. And once I'd done that, the rest of the story came together. And again, I was very, very happy that the listeners enjoyed it. I know it's, I, I think it's gone down as a kind of fan favourite in, in that range. Yeah. Um, with a u unique collection of, Bits. But I, I just didn't want to say, look, you've got two Doctors and Katarina, and then you just write a story that's like any other with a bit of joking. I said, no, it's got to be about this, and it's got to be dramatic. And we'll still get jokes in elsewhere, like Stephen Taylor not getting enough sleep because the first Doctor has got all his university chums over, and they're having a raucous time next door. I think that's very funny. But at some point, you've got to sit down and say, my best friend is going to die, and I don't want that to happen, and my future self says it's got to. And that's your story. It's making a noise. That must mean there's another time machine out there. It's another police box. 
Yeah. Hold on, everybody. Coming soon from Big Finish Productions. Doctor Who, The Early Adventures. Daughter of the Gods. Uh, hold tight, my dear. Grab hold of the ship. What is happening? But it can't be. Doctor? Doctor, what's wrong? I'm going to be your pilot, apparently. My name is... Stephen Taylor. My name is Katerina. Doctor, she still thinks she's dead. Our enemies are upon us. You must leave the planet before it is too late. This is the Chancellor of the planet Urbinia. What is your purpose? Extermination! Daleks! Big finish. We love stories. People of Armenia, listen to me. This is the Doctor. The Doctor? Of course. But why can't I remember? I remember being struck by how emotionally powerful this was. And thinking, what a scumbag taking us to a place we didn't need to go to. Yes. <laughs> she, was already, she was already dead. And you forced yeah. us into a place we didn't need to go. <laughs> yeah. So we could kill her all over again. Um yep. but but make made it all the more palpable and powerful. Yeah, I thought we, we want to see more of Katarina and I wanted it to be like I, I I'm not entirely sure Katarina would have worked as an ongoing companion in the T V series. I think it took them a while to work out how you can make an historical character work, and I think they did it with mm-hmm. Jamie. But even then they kept it quite loose. I mean that Jamie's frame of reference for technology and things changes from story to story to story, but it the, 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 the charisma of the character, Fraser Hines' performance and everything makes it work. Katarina as a character on television has very little to her. She's loyal and that's kind of it. So you think, okay, let's base that. She's ent- entirely loyal to the first Doctor and then eventually you think, what's the arc there? And I think, okay, she treats him like a god. And by the end of the story, she's got to treat him like a man, not a god. I realise he is fallible. He's not a god. He is a person. He's a man and he's fallible and he's also her friend. And that's the arc that you can do in four episodes, hopefully. Um, or three, in fact, because he's barely in episode one. And I thought that's your arc for that story. And the fact that somebody who has a frame of reference that might be, you know, very old or antiquated, still, you know, still has intelligence. The ancient Greeks were incredibly intelligent people. We still rely upon a great deal of the science and the things that they had. And a bit I, I quite liked, I guess, is uh, where, whereas Vicky and, uh, not Vicky, uh, Stephen and, 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 and Jamie and Zoe particularly find it, baffling the idea of two doctors katarina takes in her stride because she knows that you know gods and deities can have many faces and this is a something oh yeah of course they look different what's what's the deal and she can just get on board with that much better than the astrophysicist on the far future and it's just a different perspective and so that's a really fun thing to play with and i wanted to make katarina i think she's uneducated but she's still intelligent you don't need to be educated to be intelligent uh, intelligence is much rarer. It's a much rarer virtue than, than being educated. Ideally, you're intelligent and education, and, and um, everyone should have education, and education should be free for everyone to the to highest possible uh, degree. But strictly speaking, you can be uneducated and be intelligent. It is tougher and harder, but there are certain things there. And I wanted, I thought Katarina is an intelligent character, or the doctor wouldn't keep her around, you know, and she wouldn't stay around with him either, because he's difficult to get on with. You know, she's got to be intelligent. And that's what I wanted to do. And that's what I, f- I wanted the scene of her and the second Doctor to be about, where he properly recognises her, apologises and allows her to make a decision and then takes the rebuke that she gives him and goes, yes, you're absolutely right. I'm, I'm really sorry. <laughs> and then, of course, we have to do a big reset switch because continuity. But um, yeah, I, 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 I said, can, can I at least have the second Doctor remember? Can he remember this adventure, even if Katarina doesn't? And that slipped past so he does at the end he seems to he seems to remember the conversations he's had with katarina so i thought oh good i've made that canon the, the doctor remembers katarina he's remembered my story <laughs> you know at some point paul mcgann's doctor will sit there and go do you know how i remember a story called daughter of the gods where i met katarina and i think yeah good that's there good that's the bit i've added to the patchwork of doctor who yeah and i mean aja aja's awa did an amazing performance she's one really brought the character yes. to absolutely terrific i mean again wonderful performance all around but i think she studied um adrian hill um 
vocal performance and said it's very odd but she wanted to channel some of that because it was a very different it's a 1960s mm. character actor trying to do ancient greek historical stuff and go how do you do that but make it not unbearable and then, yeah <laughs> yes absolutely it's how i think she she channeled aspects of that here and there and then brought it down for most of the scene and it's a wonderful it's a wonderful performance i think it really makes you appreciate this character over again three episodes it's uh, terrific terrific stuff I've got to say that the the early adventures is a range that at the time it was out, uh, it was it was being released. It was probably my favourite range, yeah, at the time. And your stories are probably my favourite stories in that range. Oh, thank so, you. Uh, I think it's very kind. absolutely mind blowing stuff. And it's been so long. Just listening to you speak about them now, I it's been a while since I've heard them. I want to go back and listen to them right now. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I really need to go listen to them again because I I, I, listen, to, I listen to a few bits and pieces of your stuff, but I actually get to those ones. Um, I, I, I loved it because I, the heart of the era is one of my favourite eras. Uh, Troughton's one of my favourite doctors. You know, it, it, there's a lot that happens in the '60s, and there's the sheer scale of stories you could tell. Uh, I do think, you know, an era that can give you the Myth Makers, which is a tremendous story and so shocking and bizarre, and the, the Monty Python style comedy before Monty Python existed that turns into horrible massacres and all that. It's, it's a baffling four episode story. It's incredible. We're lucky to have it. I, I wish it's, if, if, if I could have any missing episodes back, it'd be the myth makers. I think it's a wonderful story, but it's a great era, the Hartley era. And, um, and particularly I, yeah. se season three uh, as well. Yeah. It's one of the most experimental seasons yeah. in the entire history of 60 year history of Dr. Who it is. Yeah. If you, if you examine each of those stories, they are absolutely incredibly experimental they were they were doing things the whole, that they've never done the before whole, or since the whole william hartnell era is like that every single mm. story just swings backwards and forwards tries new things experimental as it, yeah. it doesn't settle down to a pattern until yeah. really season six with Pep, with patrick Troughton. it's just yeah, everything I, everything is trying everything new you know let's do comedy now let's do history now let's do history with a with a sci-fi twist now let's do yeah it's just Everything is just so, it's, yeah, the sounding seasons. I think that's, seasons. that is what I love. I think whereas most seasons or eras of Doctor Who can be, if you were so inclined, reduced to a to a format and you go like unit, years, gothic horror, undergraduate comedy and all the rest of it. The Heart of the Era, yes, you've got, yeah, it's got, oh, that's historicals, but actually that's only a, what, a third of the maximum. And then you got that oh, and lots of dialects, yes, but it's one of the ones that slightly defies categorization. That's why it says, well, that's the first era where they didn't know what they were doing. And thank heavens for it, because that allows you to do so much. And I, I, and I think that's it, you know, and w once they do the historicals and they go, getting a bit bored of these, I don't know. The time meddler. There's another time lord and then you can you can change history. Actually, we lied before we can change history and it's a problem. And that's funny. And or, or, the fact that the very first time lord villain is funny as well. It's not like someone who's I mean, the war chief in the war games, great character, absolutely. But if he'd been the very first time or winning we got, I yeah, I'm sure he's very severe. And the fact that the the meddling monk is a very funny character and he's cheeky, and that his like one of his ambitions is that you know Shakespeare can premiere Hamlet on television because he thinks yeah. it'd be quite cool. He doesn't want to take over the universe. Only boring people want to take over the universe. Re real innovative minds want Hamlet on television at the time of Shakespeare. That's, that's, that's genius. That's exciting. And that's, a, that's fun. That's a magical area of Doctor Who. I don't like villains who want to take over the universe. I just, you know, uh, and so even with the Daleks, I think I, I try to do two stories, one where they are more of a, they're a, uh, they're a kind of like icon of, you know, some capitalist greed and, 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 and exploitation and coercion. And the other, they're more of a force of nature that could just come in and destroy everything. But the sort of taking over the universe bit is something which I'm not really plugged into. Um, Am I, am if you look at if you look at Peter yeah. Butterworth, um, yeah. he, he reminds me a little bit of the second Doctor, actually. Oh. So maybe the first Doctor looked at him and thought, "Oh, I like him. I want to be yeah. like him." <laughs> yeah, he's and that's, a lot of that's fun. What, yeah, he is. That's it. That's a mischievous quality. I think that's why that's what, it's the it's the the thing that I still think marks out Doctor Who from one you know, so-called serious sci-fi, which I never quite got into. Is the sense of humour, you know, Doctor Who. You know, it can be ridiculous. It can never be boring, but it can be ridiculous. It could be funny, scary, but it's the sense of humor. It's those sort of quirky weirdness of it that makes it really work. From Big Finish Productions, Doctor Who, The Eighth Doctor Adventures, Stranded, Volume One.
She used every ounce of her strength to escape the crucible. No control, no navigation. Instinct brought her to her second home, Earth. And she gave up the ghost. You're saying you own a house? Oh, this place. Isn't this Baker Street? Expensive area. Number 107. I made the investment a long time ago. Hello? Can I help you? Yes. What are you doing in my house? The past few days, everyone's becoming more paranoid that there could be someone or something else in the house. The idea of spending the rest of my life here. There are worse places to live than planet Earth. The TARDIS isn't responding at all. Well, we knew it'd be difficult. I really think I might not get her back. Doctor, Liv's been shot! I thought it was safe here, but we've lived our lives so dangerously for so long that we've forgotten death lurks everywhere. Driving a car, walking the street, working in a shop. A police box on Camden Road. I'm old enough to remember what this was really used for. Big finish. We love stories. But if we're going to be stuck here a while, we might as well give the walls a lick of paint. I'm a time lord. I don't do up kitchens. Now from first, second Doctor, Whiplash again, back to yeah. the eighth, and then in fact to the ninth. Um, so oh gosh, yes. He, so stranded would I know I know this there might be hypothetically other things in there, but yeah, we got a stranded first season, Paul McGann on Earth, be experimental, changing things around a bit. Yeah. Any idea how yes. that happened? Yeah, that was so that's my sixth, because again, Storm of the Sea Devils came before that, um, and after yeah. Daughter of the Gods. So that was Storm was my fifth and then released ages later. So my fourth release was my sixth written, and that was yes, divine uh, divine intervention. I remember the writers sort of got together and they had this idea of, yes, the Doctor and um, Liv and Helen were going to be in um, a sort of, a, not quite a block of flats, but, you know, living in, in London. And of course, I think Stranded was, I, yes, it was all sort of came up with and developed and then written and that before COVID. So the idea of the, the Doctor is now trapped in London where everything is normal, then came out just as the pandemic hit and everything became the, the most strange it's ever been. So that was a very uh, odd, I know they sort of then worked that into sort of later sets. Um, and I, I asked, they, they asked me back to, I think, do this, to be on the second set, but I, I was busy on other projects and I, at last I, I couldn't come back. So I just did that one. I'd have loved to come back and done more of it, but- um, Well, this is kind of your sitcom, uh, this is your sitcom, isn't it? You, yeah, sitcom and, sitcom and, uh, Doctor Who. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I had that sort of thing. And I, I was working for Audible and I was doing these bits and pieces and I just, I, didn't just didn't have a, a free space to do it, but um, so I had to sadly decline. But the first one, I remember actually hearing the idea and was not being totally sure of it and thinking, oh, you know, once you remove all those other aspects, will this work? It will rather will this be something that listeners want? You know, Doctor Who really stripped of literally everything um, that you might associate with it. And then, you know, the writers, I looked at the ideas and I was able to look at some early scripts because um, I needed to know. I think the original idea that I was asked to do is could you do a story which revolves around a dinner with all the people in the you know in the block being there all the sort of house guests and flatmates and things and i said absolutely could i read i'll need to read the earlier scripts because i don't know who those characters really are yeah I, especially if i'm going to do a dinner scene I, I want to read the other scripts to get a sense of their voices so i postponed writing mine till some came through and then realizing oh yeah this is really you know really really interesting material i know that um I think what was it? wild wild animals I know got particular deserved praise for you know just doing the sort of story that you wouldn't normally be able to do with Doctor Who and really delving into some difficult ethical areas and you know the limits of one's powers and the frustrations and the dangers um, and so for mine I was asked revolve around dinner can we have some aliens in it um, and I honestly I, I don't think the I think they're rock the Rakelians. I did two aliens. I don't think they rank amongst my my best characterized uh, uh, writing. Um, I was sort of more focused on the Doctor and Liv and Helen and the other characters. But um, there was a lot. That was one of those ones where there's a lot to juggle. I wanted to sort of set up the sort of you know, the seeds or the who the baddies might be later, and the Doctor needed to sort of regain some power in the TARDIS, and we wanted aliens that were somehow tied into that. And of course, there are all these other characters. So that and 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 um, and uh, uh, Andy, of course, I think from the from the Torchwood series. So there's a lot of elements to juggle in that, an extended cast of characters. So that one, I think, I rather than pursuing any particular themes that was more of a case of there is a lot that this needs to do i will focus on making sure it does all those things and then in the space in between 
do the song. So the the scenes at the beginning where the doctor's on a game show, which I quite enjoyed doing. There, that's something I just thought, oh, that'd be fun. I I like the idea of the doctor going, oh, I know how we can fix the TARDIS. I'll win a game show every week, and then them having to tell him they're not going to invite you back to keep winning. That's not going to happen. And him really thinking, why not? I was good at it. I quite liked all those early argument scenes where again the doctor sort of slightly naive alien perspective butts up with people who actually know what they're talking about so that was a lot of fun to do but it was um that was a real writing hoping i was everything was working because there were so many moving parts and really just relying on on matt fett in particular who was orchestrating all this that it would work um and i think it does <laughs> i think it did uh, i know divine intervention uh went on as as a sort of you know in the later sets and they tied everything together very neatly but i remember matt at one point saying to me so where does this where does this story i go and I go, i've no idea i don't know i thought it sounded like a good idea at the time <laughs> this sort of almost like sort of scientology type sort of organization and let's see where that goes but um yes i i i, I think matt and john probably had some specific ideas they were working towards and i just hoped that mine didn't ruin them well, this, is, then, this, is, this, is, this is this is the most sitcom of all your Doctor Who shows, mm. and and there were several points that I remember laughing out loud. Listen to this, especially around the dinner and some of the fast fast school stuff that happens. Yeah, at the restaurant, it's just ridiculous. But it's a it's a fun mm. it's a fun sort of setting, and um and I think that's the one which I think that set <clears throat> won an Audi award, which um, we were all sent individuals to these big statues, and we all got one, which I was. Ba- baffled by so that was my first award for some for anything for having written 25 percent of this set so i've got an award song with my name just like somewhere i think slightly above that of like paul mcgann and tom baker which i said <laughs> if i could go on back and told 10 year old david look at this wouldn't believe it wouldn't believe it at all from big finish productions doctor who the ninth doctor adventures old friends welcome to my funeral. Sarah Jane always knew you'd go distinguished. Or was that Harry? Explain the USP. Our premium service allows for the most personal farewell between the deceased and their loved ones that science can presently provide. For a few hours, we can restore their mind and body to the very peak of health. But what for? So the dead can return and attend their own funerals. Ollie! What's wrong? I thought we were going at the same time. It would have looked amazing. Remember, killer on the loose. Yep, got that. Thanks. And try not to worry, but this is going to hurt. What, me? No, me. Thank your name and rank. Brigadier Alistair Gordon Lethbridge Stewart. Hello, you open? I only just got here, mate. Okay, whatever. Uh, one Americano, one hazelnut latte, as soon as you can. You what? You know about green men. <laughs> like you wouldn't believe. You love it. Every single moment, I can tell. Yes, well, it uh, pays to keep the hand in. That's why I've been helping out down at the base. What base is that? Running log of the HMS Columba experimental sub, day 312. At his son, the doctor's a sterling chap, and please, please call me Alistair. My shouting days are over. As you like, Alistair. I'm Sam Bishop, second lieutenant. What is this machinery about you, this fearsome engine? Big finish for the love of stories. He saved so many of them, no matter how dangerous it was. Wonderful work. Such a pity he's dead. Next, you're up for the box at Old Friends um, with, for Christian yes. Eccleston. Yeah, um, I think. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So there was a few that went in between that. I'm trying to remember what, but yes, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. yeah. Don't, tell, don't tell us about them. We're not, we can't talk no. about them. <laughs> no, no. Um, yeah. So tell us about in terms of being asked to write for Chris and when that happened. I think that this, was. So this is the, this is, no, yeah. it's, it's, it's the fourth box set in series one, the stuff he did. Yeah. So um, we're on, and I think we're looking at maybe 2020. I was or 2021. I think the silent stories I wrote just before. Um, oh, okay. Wow. So that yes, you did actually. Because yes, they were 2020. This is tw- yeah. This was recorded 2021. So and the silent yeah, so stuff I, was 2020. 
Yes, yeah, so I did the silent stories, um, which Matt asked me to do, and then he said, oh, we're doing Eccleston. Um, don't tell anyone, but we're doing Eccleston. We're to write an Eccleston. I said, well, of course. It was the, the Doctor who, the first new Doctor that I was aware of and enjoyed going out live, live, um, you know, for the first time, first original transmission. And, of course, absolutely. And I think the thing of, they said, so the story is going to be set prior to Rose, and we want to... I, I said, oh, should we do, do you, does it need to be sort of dark and a bit sort of, you know, gloomy and stuff? He said, no, actually, uh, Chris would rather we sort of um, not go so much into the time war elements quite so much. But can we explore other areas? Because, you know, we did the time war on television and can we go to other bits? So I know a lot of the writers focused on sort of like quite uh, sort of lighter stories and sort of comic or sort of in other bits and pieces. And I know John was doing a, a sort of um, Doctor Who uh, does Metropolis or a piece of Metropolis style Cyberman. Mm -hmm. um, uh, God, who directed Metropolis? Why, why have I forgotten? Helen Goldwyn. Oh, uh, Metropolis. Oh, the original, yeah, the original film. Christ, why have I forgotten? One of the biggest uh, um, directors of all time. Uh, and I've now. Uh, Fritz, Fritz, Fritz Lang. Lang. Thank you. God. Fritz Lang. Yeah. Doctor Who meets Fritz Lang, and there's a Cyberman. I thought it was a brilliant pitch. But, it was um, brilliant. I was at that time. I think I just done the silent stories and they said, could we have some ideas for this? And I was sort of frantically looking around and that's why I pitched them. Doctor Who goes to an intergalactic funeral parlor. And they went, is, is this because you've, is, is this the, your sitcom, your, your undertakers in a funeral parlor sitcom that you, we know you for? I went, no, it's a totally different funeral parlor. And I put different characters in it, but that was sort of, I had a few other ideas I pitched as well, but there was this, this one where I said, he goes to a funeral parlor where you can attend your own funeral. And they said, how does that work? Because I, I don't know, but that, that, that's, that, that's what the figures. And they went, yeah, okay, we like that idea. That's got an interesting sci-fi hook. Um, and then uh, I thought the idea of, yeah, what would you do if you could come back and see all your guests at your own funeral and how weird that would feel? And then I thought, well, the technology to do that is probably going to do, it's not going to be reanimating a corpse, that's too ghoulish. Nobody would want that. So it's probably like a an android or an avatar or something. And then at that point, are you even really the same person you were? And if someone's above you, can they edit you or change you? And then I think, well, who would want to do that? And I thought, okay, a story of, you know, let, let's take something which is big in sci-fi and what would Russell T Davies do, which is find a very human angle and a very sort of personal, sort of domestic, um, emotional character drama angle of that and have the Doctor and discover that and um, essentially make it a kind of detective story where the Doctor knows something is happening, something has gone wrong, and the story is him trying to work out what that is. Um, and so that was a really interesting story to do. And again, with Eccleston's still quite sort of, blunter sort of brusque take on the doctor which i really enjoyed uh, he's one of my favorite doctors um so sort of putting that in there um and even though we weren't going to do any stories like set in the time or, or off the time or that sense of a person who is who understands the importance of memory the importance of time the importance of spending time with the people that you love and that for that to be honest, that you need to have an honest recollection to understand that the good comes with the bad and that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, I think a doctor who understands those things also realizes that not everyone wants to hear it. And so if you say to a grieving widow, your husband wasn't exactly everything he was cracked up to be, well, that's not really the best time to say it. But if there are deadly robots trying to kill you, perhaps you've got to, <laughs> and you've got to force this reckoning. And then at the end, I think the ecosystem, I think a lot of my Doctor Who stories, despite the fact I'm a sitcom writer, a lot of my Doctor Who's end with the Doctor realising he's either failed or things have gone right, but not the way he wanted, or he's generally a bit depressed. And he kind of leaves the TARDIS going, oh, I hope I actually, God, I hope I did some good. And I think Eccles' Doctor just ends, you know, we, we tied it into seeing the Brigadier, but very much a sense of sometimes I don't even, basically I don't even know why I bother. I don't really know if I'm doing the right thing at all. Because, yeah, I saved lives, but she's miserable, she's miserable, you've been banged up in the nick. Uh, if all these people are crying, I don't know if I should have turned up here today. But that's something you, I think that, that, uh, that goes with Eccles' Doctor really well. He, he's one of the flawed hero Doctors, particularly you know um he's one of the doctors who more than any of the others inspires other characters to do the brave and difficult thing um I, I don't think there are many eccleston tv stories where he's the one who actually then saves the day himself he's usually 
inspiring people or telling people what they need to do to save the day. And I think that's a really interesting take on the Doctor. He's quite active, mm. but he's also reactive at the same time. Yeah. Now, that was all recorded during lockdown. So were you able to listen in on any of that or... I guess you didn't get to meet Chris no, at all or not? I, I didn't know these. So the lockdown, I'm not sure how the, the lockdown one sort of happened, but there were, yes, I was able to, I was able to return the recordings, the stories before lockdown, but not during. So there was a few stories of mine done in lockdown, which I, I wasn't able to go to recording or attend online. So I, 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 alas, I didn't meet Christopher Eccleston or Sylvester McCoy. I've met Paul McGann, but not at Big Finish. I've met him in a few other places, but, um, uh, yes, yeah, so whereas I was able to go and meet Tom Baker, for instance, I've not been able to meet them. I would have liked to. I really wanted to meet uh, Chris Eccleston to say how important his doctor was to me. The fact that that was Doctor Who that came back and was successful and brilliant and became a show that you were able to talk about at school. And that his doctor, I think, was so important to have a doctor. And it was a genius idea of Russell T. Davis and Eccleston to have a doctor who could because he had, you know, he had a sort of northern accent he had, and sort of certainly more sort of working class accent. He dressed in sort of like dress, he sort of dressed down compared to, especially compared to Paul McGann's eighth doctor. He was a dressed down doctor. And the idea that the doctor didn't have to be a space Victorian, but could be somebody you would conceivably meet in your hometown. Like I believed I could bump into Eccleston's doctor in, in, in Portsmouth. And he, and he was like the sort of doctor who might come from, obviously, northern but you know he could come from that sort of background and still be a hero who's brilliant and exciting and funny and dangerous and witty you didn't need to sound like you're a, a bbc actor from the 50s to be doctor who you could be christopher eccleston and and that was amazing it was so important to have that and i absolutely i still think it's very important his doctor so being able to write for him eventually i would have loved to have met him and to say all this he probably would be terrified he'd just back away and go oh, okay but I'd love to have told him how important and how much his doctor meant to me seeing it for the first time. Yeah, well, hopefully you'll still get the chance. Hopefully, hopefully I'll still meet him one day. But uh, yeah, I'd love, I'd love to tell him a version of that somehow. Now, just released, but written back in 2018 and recorded in 2019, yeah. is Storm of the Sea Devil. So you finally Storm got to ride Devil. for the fourth doctor and meet Tom Baker. Yes, um, that was, yeah. Now, once again, the the schedule of how things get released at Big Finish is confusing as all heck. Yeah. Um, it, it must be exciting to finally get this out. Absolutely. So Storm with the Sea Delves is my second story for Tom and the first released and the other one hasn't even been announced. So that's the weird. This is my second time doing Tom and I came off it just off Daughter of the Gods, which had been an absolute nightmare to write. And so Storm of the Sea Devils, I think like they said, we, we, we're bringing back Harry, so we're, can you reintroduce Harry Sullivan? And I love Harry. Um, so that first Tom Baker's first season was my first season. We're introducing this character called Naomi, and at that point, like later on, suddenly I think they, the, Harry and Naomi were in unit sets, and they were with Sylvester McCoy as well. And at the time I was writing the script, I didn't know any of that was happening. I don't know. Well, that's that's, that's, that. that's all come out first, even though yes. you've written yours first. This is first yeah. written. So, so and, and there's I all these things so. like how how on earth is Harry and Naomi traveling <laughs> yeah, with the we're... same doctor? We've been waiting then, years for this uh, first story. We've been waiting years because, because I think they first appear in units. So they, yes. they first appear in units, and then the Seventh Doctor appears. Now they're trying with the Seventh Doctor. I think, how the heck did all this happen? Yeah, and, I, I think if, was, cause that, if I'd known that, I think I would have tried to, I would have concocted something more momentous than they bump into each other at an airport. But, <laughs> but at, at the time I was writing it, I was told that this was the first story that Naomi was appearing in at all, and the first time that Harry was coming back. So I thought it was an introductory story. So I focused it on kind of on episode one spends a long time on with harry and naomi and bringing them together and putting them on an adventure and then i thought right we've what do i do i need to ensure that harry gets enough to do because we love harry and so i and i wanted to really get into the, the his medical background so i asked a few surgeons that i knew you know if you're out in the middle of the sticks and somebody has been bitten by a crocodile or something, you know, what would you do? Uh, and they said, well, <laughs> probably throw my hands up and go, I'm you're a goner. But you know, if I had to do something, this is the sort of things I would do. But I thought I've also got to have Naomi as someone who meets the doctor. And I've got to have the doctor really like her and a reason for that and reasons for Naomi want to travel with him. And so that sets up later. And that's why there's a sort of a scene in part four, which is my favourite scene or sequence to write, which was the, the doctor sort of taking devil's advocate and, having an argument with Naomi about why the sea devils and you know should be allowed to sort of share the planet with humans, et cetera, and go, well, 
are they these big lizards? Why on earth should we allow that to happen? And Naomi can demonstrate for herself, for like, you know, her deeply held ethics, beliefs, the things that mark her out as being different from unit, other typical unit soldiers and this sort of thing. And why the doctor would say, yes, you're the sort of person who I, I would love to well, spend so more time with. Yeah. I, mean, that, that, I, I, that, I love that scene so much because any companion who's been with the doctor would know the doctor was faking. He wouldn't be taking that line because he, yes, he's absolutely. so harsh and so mean and so nasty. Yeah. But of course, it's him testing her. And of course, her yeah. whole heart is coming out. And I was actually thinking, yeah. I really want to travel with this person. She's great. That's, it's, um, it's what, thank you. It's, it's what I was hoping. It's and something you can do with Tom's doctor. He does have that. Though you know he wouldn't actually believe it, you would believe that he would say these things to motivate someone. It's like Sylvester yeah. McCoy's doctor can be quite dark. Tom's doctor has those reserves of darkness. I think when I, my first Tom story, my first draft, the notes I got back were, you've made him too comic. And I know he's, we think of him as being one of the funny doctors. And season 17 is one of my favourite seasons. So I always think of later Tom. But early Tom is rather darker, moodier, and the jokes are a bit of a darker style. So in the rewrites to that first story, I sort of softened, I made him a bit darker and moodier. For this script, I started off with that. And I thought he can be funny. And Tom Baker himself throws in a lot of ad libs in recording. And he will play with the dialogue. And, and one thing he does, which is, it's not just for himself, it's, he's not someone who goes, I want to give myself the best lines. If he's got... If he has an idea for an interaction which gives another actor the funny line and he'll have a set up to that funny line, he'll, he'll voice that. He's, he's very good of saying to, oh, if you say, if I say this and you say this, I think that'd be terrifically funny. It'd be a very good joke for, for you to do. And I can say this. And then and then later on in this later scene, oh, <laughs> you could say this instead. I think that I'd be a Nick. It's up to you. I mean, you might think this is worthless and I'll shut up, but it's a good idea. And he will do all this. And it's quite, as a writer, it's terrifying, of course, because uh, you've been kept on your toes. And you think, oh, Mike. But he will come up with lines for other actors. And it, 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 he's always trying to come up with these little things. His, his scripts are covered in notes. He prepares very thoroughly. He's covered in notes and bits and questions and things he wants to ask. So he really interrogates the script. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I had all this to do. And um, and I think to us, I also, I know it's one of the more, I, I think of all the big finishes I've done, it's probably the most traditional in its story and in its structure and being a sea devil story. And to me, I think it's a bit more, I think I would have liked in hindsight to have played around with that a bit more but I think I just come off of Daughter of the Gods which was so difficult and so different and weird I sort of wanted a story where I, I need to I need to write a typical four-part 70s Doctor Who story and then find a way to make it different so I'll have a traditional structure but I'll make it different and I thought okay I want I don't want it to be set in the home counties I want it to be set in India I want a place with a rainforest and I said what about the Amazon they said we've got a story of the Amazon coming out soon. I'm like, okay. And I said, okay, India. And at that time I was doing a lot of audible work with audible India. I haven't, uh, I have been to India since, but uh, I was doing, I work with audible internationally, Singapore, Australia, India. And I said, I'm going to do set it in India and sea devils in the swamps. That's interesting. And I had these ideas of uh, if this were Hinchcliffe, you'd have sea devils, you know, lurking out of the rivers and hiding behind trees and a lightning storm. That's exciting. Okay. We'll have that. And, um, and we'll have a, uh, what was the setting? Um, uh, a hotel person's made a hotel for big game hunters and shady businessmen in the middle of the, uh, the middle of the, the swamps. And then he's found a sea devil. So he shut it. And that's why unit investigates. And, and I came up with all that. I, my original idea was actually a story set in, Oh, gosh. Um, I think it was going to be uh, I was going to do something set like on the on the, the on, on the sort of southern in southern France in sort of like um, in sort of the casino areas and the marinas. And it was going to be about criminals working with the sea devils to knock off people they didn't like. But um, it was going to be very, very ITC Avengers-y, but I, I just couldn't quite make it work. So I plugged a hotel in the middle of a rainforest and said, right, let's see what we can do and do that. Um, and uh, I think I, I listened to it recently and I think it's uh, the performers are certainly having a great time. Tom seems to be having a great, great time. He's having a giving a lot of energy. I love um, uh, Chris Naylor doing uh, doing uh, Harry, a really sort of a lovely sort of touching tribute to, to, to Ian and Marta. Uh, I think Naomi, um, Eleanor, Eleanor Crooks are doing a lovely job. It's it was a it's so odd to listen to a childhood hero of yours from eight years old doing your dialogue in a story that you've written. Um, it, it, 
doesn't so yes i feel that's why it's possibly it's a more of a traditional structure a traditional sea devil story because i was still trying to cope with the idea of i'm writing for my childhood hero a person tom baker's performance as doctor who shaped so much of my life and it's very hard to distance yourself from that and be just a professional writer you're kind of trapped in that go oh my god what am i doing here and so you try to you you pitch out so i said traditional structure monsters based under siege but how do we then make that a bit different and hopefully to, <laughs> to a greater or less extent i succeeded i don't know um but that's 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 me doing traditional 70s doctor who so i can say i've done that what's interesting about everyone has a, a different perspective on stories depending on where you are so yeah. I, at the moment I'm in the outback of Australia. I'm in crocodile, well, not quite co crocodile country. If I go to the coast, there's crocodiles there. So I was thinking a lot about the crocodile aspect and I'm thinking, <laughs> okay, so, so how are the, how are the sea devils coexisting with the crocodiles? I'm yeah. also thinking a little bit of, you know, in the lagoon, I'm thinking of, I've got black and white images going through my head, creature from the black lagoon yes, <laughs> with that, yep. that, that creature swimming around as well. That, you know, that could have been the inspiration there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it made me research crocodiles in India because I was thinking, oh, are there saltwater crocodiles in India? And yeah. so I researched that. Yes, there are. There are. There are actually three types. And I found one type of crocodile in India where there's only about 300 left in the wild. I'd never heard of these ones before. So it's interesting what Doctor Who stories make you do. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that, that, that kind of research. Um, and I was also thinking about the, the, the character who was training the crocodiles yes and i'm thinking that you probably wouldn't do that with the crocodiles in australia so much uh <laughs> you you wouldn't be trying to train them like uh like like dogs here but um that's why i was thinking about the different types of crocodiles over there yeah. so I mean, I'm fascinating sure you, fascinating I'm the sure way you, what you made me think I, of with your story I, i'm fairly sure you we shouldn't try and train them in india either it's uh that's a sort yeah. of like um <laughs> the bit where you sit and you go what do i do i think the original idea the original name of the story was the uh the man who collected crocodiles and then they said that's a lovely title but we we kind of want sea devils to be in the title so uh, uh people know what they're getting but okay sure let me check storm with the sea devils um but it's, it was also I, I just wanted to have a story set in a different location and i thought I, i'd really like to have a majority uh, indian or indian diaspora cast um of, of actors in that and i just thought I, let's give it a different setting um and let's do see do something uh, differently i remember doing like tons and tons of research mainly political research none of which got <laughs> used <laughs> so i did loads of research into things and then uh, other bits i just sort of went i don't have time so um I, I think there are aspects of the, I think I would have liked in hindsight to have spent a bit more time. I mean, because this is a script I wrote like five or six years ago. <laughs> so I think I would have liked to have done a bit more of the sea devils and there was like a symbiotic relationship with the crocodiles. Um, that would have been quite fun. And maybe they could have used the crocodiles in their attack. I think actually I was probably slightly influenced by, um, oh God, there's an old episode of Thunderbirds, which is about giant alligators attacking a, a shack in the middle of nowhere. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a rainforest and Thunderbirds was a huge show I loved in my you know when I was like five and for some mm. reason that's always stuck with me so I was probably thinking of that like people stuck in a building in the middle of a swamp and lizards are attacking so I was probably thinking of that and then I stuck it in India um, but again do it was know, nice to be at, th at that recording and meet those cast as well the actors do you know whether this was delayed release due to um, the um doctor who show that came out with the sea devils the legend of the sea devils or was this always due to come out now yes i don't know the the sort of the scheduling the quirks of the scheduling are something that i <clears throat> am totally uh, have no knowledge i mean sometimes uh, the editor in question might say oh this is being done for so for instance the the tom baker that i wrote in i see i, I wrote one in in 2018 which has not been announced yet and i we wrote it and then it was recorded and afterwards i said oh so when's that being released and they said at the moment i think it might be 2023 and i went what <laughs> that's years away i went yeah yeah and now it's been pushed back further because they have other things that come through and i've no idea i i had no idea that i think the silent stories or that that classic doctor set was meant to come out last year and then suddenly i had march where i had three doctor who's coming out in the same month after not having had one released for about two years despite the fact i've been writing them quite regularly about one or two a year you just have these strange gaps and you just try to get your head around it and and then you know i think like uh, actually you mentioned um uh, amina zaya um who's a uh, amateur in in storm of the sea devils like a lovely lovely actor who i think she was in i'm she was in this and then she was in and uh, she was also in stranded 
Um, but because I did Storm of Sea Devils first, that was accorded first, I met her there, and then she did Stranded, so I already knew her, but they are released the other way around, and that's very, very confusing, and I've long since, you know, if Doctor Who can't get unit dating sorted, I can't possibly get the big finish release schedule, it's, it's, it's as much a mystery. <laughs> well, let's, let's turn to your last release, which is, also came out last month as well, um, and I must say, these two releases are why I had to contact you, I was, I was just blown away by them. Um, the I'm Silent delighted. Priest and the Silent City. Um, so from the Broken Memories box set, which is Classic Doctor's New Monsters, and you got two silent stories. Now, we, we don't want to give spoilers yep. away, but it's the first story is the to the Eighth Doctor Time War, the, and then the next story is the Seventh Doctor, but they actually are in the right order. So even though yes. it's... Eighth Doctor first, followed by Seventh Doctor. It is the two stories are sort of three or four years apart, yeah. same setting, yeah. um, same similar some some same characters. Yeah. So it is sort of like one big story. Um, can I just say you just nailed the silence and Thank you. what they could do, and it's always hard bringing back classic monsters because well, I'm calling the sounds classic now they are classic. Um, it's always hard to bring classic monsters back because you tend to want to make them do what they've always done. You yeah. progress the silence to a very different place, keeping them still in touch with who the, their roots, um, yeah. but also was quite dramatic in terms of what you did in the setting. Um, oh. So why why are you such a love of the silence? So that was, I think it's, yeah, it's, um, I think trying to find like a new take on these sort of concepts, I think it's what I, probably should have pushed a bit more on the sea devils to do something a bit more different with them but say i had so many other things to try and deal with the sea devils ended up being one of the more traditional elements whereas this story um from the beginning i was set uh, matford and said yeah i'd like two stories one with the eighth doctor followed by one with the seventh and it's got the silence and i went okay those are all very difficult elements like i'm used to doing char evolving character dialogue where you establish a relationship or a dynamic and you move it along that's very hard to do when the characters keep forgetting they ever met the other person and every time they meet them is the first time so that's incredibly difficult and i went okay what do we do and and i was desperately trying to think of you know i, I think sometimes i was uh, uh i asked john dorney how do you come up with these different stories and he said sometimes sometimes you'll be on a walk and you'll come up with something or you'll have a conversation sometimes you just stood in front of your dvd collection going that and you just do Doctor Who does that film <laughs> and you know, Doctor Who does like the the Fifth Element Doctor Who does the Towering Inferno Doctor Who does uh, Richard Curtis rom com and uh, for this time I was sitting there not knowing and I just seen or rewatched the Maltese Falcon which is uh, a, a film yeah, a film I absolutely love absolutely fantastic film and um I and I there are elements of that in in Silent Priest as, not just the setting but other elements I won't go any further because you know spoilers etc but um. I wanted to do a, a story with, I like having just one, one character who is the monster. And I wanted, I like the idea of the silent priest. And I thought, okay, a priest, the eighth doctor, what about time or eighth doctor? I like the idea of a doctor who goes to meet a priest who he keeps forgetting he's met, but not because he is religious, but because the idea that you might speak to someone about terrible things you can't tell anyone else. And there's maybe there's this one person that you go to and you disappear and then you just forget you ever did. But somehow you still have this sense that you've just done something that was helpful and cleansing. And I thought, oh, so that's quite a nice idea. A silent priest in a church. And then I had this sort of run down setting. And I thought, OK, we'll have this place with like uh, rival criminal gangs. I think it, 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 in my head, I imagined it as um, a bit the Maltese Falcon, but also there's a, a British movie called... Um, uh, the Long Good Friday with Bob Hoskins and oh. Brighton Rock as well. So I had this idea of a sort of slightly more British seaside sort of coastal town with elements. And then I think the actual production um, goes a bit further into sort of more sort of American film noir than I had imagined, but I still think it works very well and very nicely. Um, and that sort of fusion of a few elements there and, the, and a casino and, and, a, and a police chief who's barely keeping it together and all the criminal elements and then how could i do a story where i think what stephen moffat often said about two-parters on television and during his era was the way he felt a two-parter should work is that the second episode should take should begin in a very different place it shouldn't just carry on from the last 
And I thought that's a good idea. So the silent priest should end with it on its own terms. And the silent city, let's see what's happened a few years on, where the events of the end of the previous story have shaped what's happened now. But it's and, and then you think, how does the doctor get involved? And then it becomes an evolving mystery of motivations and uh, uh, and ethics and morality and why people are doing what they're doing. And. I did see, a, I think a few people online have said they actually listened to the Silent City first and they actually thought the story made more sense for the Seven Doctor story first, followed by the Eighth. Um, and I thought, fair, I mean, if they can be enjoyed either way around, great, but they are very much intended to be the Eighth first, followed by the Seventh, because for me, a city where crime effectively, where, 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 where the sort of criminal aspects sort of, sort of start to disappear and it becomes a thriving place again, is more interesting and for me the the silent that i thought even though the silent priest as a character is not necessarily the main character in both stories because there's a lot of other characters around that's the story the narrative i wanted to follow and i can't say much because it then because there's too much in the stories and i don't want to spoil them but for me it was seeing how this place changes and the influence the doctor has on people in that first story and how his influence shapes the second and then the seventh doctor gets involved with no idea of what the eighth doctor has done of course on a very different agenda and ends up having to sort of cope with a few of the things the eighth doctor has done perhaps without even realizing it i'm being very cagey here it's very yeah, hard to describe that, 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 uh, yes but when people, when people listen to the stories and come back to this they'll hopefully. know exactly what you're yeah. saying but that's it. it was it was me doing i think the first story is multi folk and the second story has a few elements taken from a film by Fritz Lang, uh, Dr. Mabosa from the 20s, a, which is about this, uh, uh, it's about a sort of a criminal uh, type and the ways he manipulates a society. And, um, but there, there are a lot, again, those stories, there are a lot of um, ethical things and moral things I wanted to delve into. Particularly the second story has a lot to do with money, it has a lot to do with uh, poverty, it has a lot to do with uh, wealth distribution, the difference between rich and poor. Um, how businesses are involved with that as well um people trying to do the, the right thing it's it's a, i think to be honest in a way it links right back to my first big finished dalek occupation of winter they're both s stories about systemic oppression and exploitation and how you might be able to defeat that figure or that person but the problems still stay because the problems are firmly rooted in a society and a culture and that is that is a that's a a, a problem that even the doctor finds very very difficult to deal with and that's the sort of story I think I've realized through doing Big Finish, I'm quite interested in. I always used to think I was just a silly comedy person. And through the stories I've done Big Finish, I've actually discovered all the sort of political themes I'm actually really interested and fired up about. Mm. And then I start to do them and other things. So I, I think the silent stories are quite political. But um, again, I won't say too much. But I, I'm absolutely uh, really, really thrilled that you love them. I, I had no idea if anyone would like them. I thought they might be a bit too weird. <laughs> and so I didn't I... know. I think that the fact you were able to make the Silent Priest a real character was pretty powerful. Mm. I think the fact that it's such a difficult concept that every time they stop seeing, they forget. And yeah. so it, it could be really boring to keep going through the same dialogue again. But but yeah. you managed to find ways of getting around that. The, yeah. the, the thing, the story I now want you to write, though, is actually the story from the, the view of the Silent Priest. What is it like to always be yeah. forgotten? Because yeah. to me... I, I was I was starting to feel. I mean, because I think Nick Briggs's performance is spectacular, yeah. and I couldn't tell it was Nick. I actually went went looking to see who it was because yeah. I, I couldn't hear Nick in the silence at all. And he manages to portray so much different storytelling skills, emotion yeah. in that performance. I think far better than we saw on TV. Um, I was really struck by him. And as I said, I left wanting to know what is it like to be the silent priest when yeah. no one remembers you. Yeah where you have to keep I, having that conversation. So that's your next story. That's, uh, I think that'd be excellent. I think it's, that's when I sort of went on, I think it was the TARDIS wiki and I was reading up the science before I was, when I was coming up with ideas and the idea that, oh yes, they're technically they're priests, but we didn't get to see much of that on television. I think there's a bit in Time with the Doctor where some priests go, confess, confess, confess. But um, as ever with a, with a Doctor Who monster, for want of a better term, sometimes you're, the, the thing that you're sort of hoarded with and writing dialogue is that the, the monsters speak very slowly. <laughs> and the silence and the sea devils and the Daleks and all the others quite often speak quite slowly. And so you have to 
limit the amount of dialogue you give them. And I think the silent has quite a bit of dialogue. Even then, it's the reason why I suppose the character doesn't appear more often is I thought whenever they do, the scenes will end up being quite slow, raspy conversations. So he didn't get as much. So, you know, you have to sort of be sparing, but also still have a presence. And you're, it's always a juggle. Every Doctor Who is a juggling act. But I also, I, uh, I'd love to, you know, if there's ever room for a prequel or a version, you know, where we actually just examine what it's like just to be this priest. And we see it from, their, say, from their point of view. It was, it'd be, what would be got, I, I, a story from the Simon Priest's point of view where different doctors keep walking in from mm. across all the time span and every one of them thinks they're meeting him for the first time. There we go. That's mm. a story. I'd like to do well, that. It, big finish of listening. That's what I have to well, do. Well, it, it felt like you were getting that because, you know, quite often, yeah. you know, oh, you know, you know and it, the sudden thing, oh, we've met. We've talked before. We've like, met there's before. a number, there's a couple yeah. of times you did that throughout the two plays. But every yes. time it was kind of, I felt for the silence in terms of, oh, you poor yeah. thing. Like, you have to explain yeah. again who you are that you've already met. I was thinking, yeah. what, what sort of life must it be like where, where constantly oh. no one remembers you? Very, I say very sad. I think it's again one of those stories which, like Dalek Occupation and Breach of Trust and others, is, is sort of a tragedy with numerous comic moments. And he tried to find those comic moments where you can. But um, yes, for somebody who says he's a, a sitcom writer, I write a lot of depressing Doctor Who. <laughs> but uh, hopefully, he's still enjoyable. Hopefully, still enjoyable. And uh, you know, the best stories are those when you're writing about something you care about, and then you find this wonderful vehicle to do it with. And um, writing for McGann again and McCoy for the first time was wonderful. And to contrast the kind of more instinctual sort of emotionally led eighth doctor with the, 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 the this sort of, you know, um, more sort of, I suppose, intellectual seventh, but then the seventh doctor is one of those characters. There's a scene early on where he meets a, a homeless person and they have a conversation. And it's the sort of scene that I can imagine Sylvester McCoy's doctor uniquely doing in that kind of way. And there's something magic about the seventh doctor, the Eighth Doctor is sort of heroic in in, in, in certain ways, and you know, the time war has driven out of him. But he's a sort of a, 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 I suppose, a slightly more conventionally heroic figure. And you find the shading in there that Paul McGann loves. He loves the sort of the dark cynicism of the Doctor. Sylvester McCoy is such a weird sort of figure anyway, and he's got a wonderful voice. But there's something kind of you can put the Seventh Doctor in any situation. He will look equally odd in every situation. But he will also somehow look as if he belongs there. And he's a doctor who you can see sitting down in a, in a muddy puddle talking with a homeless person and talking to them and not being, in, you know, disrespectful or whatever. He, he's somebody who's a sick man talking to them on their level and treat, you know, having a proper conversation. And you can imagine the same doctor meeting people at the top of society and kings and queens and people. He can be anyone and it will work. And that's something that I think that's pretty special with the seventh doctor. I think see, you always want to think with any drama, you, you, you were kind of thinking, OK, you want to tailor this to the lead actor and every doctor is different. And you want to write a story that only that doctor could do in that way. And I always want to do that. I'm not sure if I've succeeded, but I've always tried to think what are the specifics of my doctor and their companions? And how do you tailor a story to suit their strengths and make them bigger? Um, try to be sort of very character led, actor led. Mina Anwar. Yeah, I so really enjoyed her performance in this uh, because normally you see her as the bumbling, happy type character. Even in other guest roles that she's had in the TV yeah. series, Doctor Who, yeah. uh, I think yeah. Smile, she was like a bumbling, happy type person too for a little while until she was killed. Yeah. Um, but in this, she gets to play the the really dark um, gangster type character, which is uh, which was really, really cool. And I think she enjoyed it too. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice to have um, yeah, give actors sort of chances to do things they wouldn't have done elsewhere. And she she hadn't. I think she said she hadn't played, um, she hadn't played a a, a villain before. I um, hadn't done many of those. Yeah, I mm. remember her. I grew up. Um, I remember a, a sitcom that she co-starred in called The Thin Blue Line, which was a sort of a police sitcom starring David Hayes. Yeah, that's Rowan that's Atkinson. right first. That's right first. Sorry, yeah. yeah. That's it. And I told my friends, some of my friends from Portsmouth, you also used to do that. I said, hey, you will never guess who's in my next Doctor Who. And I said, it was, it's Officer Constable Habib from the Thin Blue Line. They went, no, really? He went, yeah, 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 Mina Anwar. So, and she was, yeah, I think she's wonderful. She's wonderful in both those stories. And I'm glad, you know, she said, uh, I think in the extras, um, that she was delighted to finally get to play a villain. And you go, great, that's what Doctor Who should be doing. Doctor Who should be able to give great actors opportunities to do things they wouldn't get to do elsewhere. So I'm delighted. I'm, I'm happy that she enjoyed herself. Yes, great cast. Well, listen, you've produced eight stories so far. There's not a dud amongst them. Uh, in fact, I'd put all eight at a really high level. All of them are fantastic joys That's to listen very to. Kind. 
And um, I'm looking forward to seeing what else you produce. And I hope we get some new stuff as well. So listen, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, thank you for asking. And I, I, I thank you for uh, bearing with me as I gave you incredibly long answers to every question. <laughs> uh, we love it. We love it. From Big Finish Productions, Doctor Who, classic doctors, new monsters, broken memories. An ore freighter heading directly for Sistelzin. On a, it's on a collision course. Giant grasshopper strapped into the driving seat. Oh, 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 it must have been killed in the crash. I was right. Yes, it, it is a human brain, but why put it in the head of a dead insect? <laughs> they are harmony shows. Oh, they will not be disembodied for long. I suspect, are we alone, by the way, because we're dealing with some sort of uh, cerebral endoparasite with the ability to animate the bodies of the dead. The Catherine de' Medici. Oh, you're a colony. And going by the name, from Earth. A group of droids breached the wall near the West Gate, Your Majesty. The droids came with the ship. The droids maintained everything. They all want to turn us into them. They're building robots out of bits of people. Stop, go, stop, go. <laughs> Acquire resources. Rebuild, 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 rebuild. This city, it is an unhappy place. The place has seen better days, hasn't it? We have met. What? What are you? Out of sight. Out of mind. Two years ago, this city was on the brink of tearing itself apart. Then suddenly, the fighting ends. Crime plummets. And now, it's a flourishing holiday paradise. Corruption. It's everywhere. Fascinating. So, you disappear from a human's memory, do you? I take it you're going to kill me. You have said that five times in the past minute. Time, Lord. Big finish for the love of stories. Uh, normally at the end of the show, we uh, we do recommendations of things that we've been listening to, Philip. But what I would like to recommend this week is that everyone go to the bigfinish.com and in the search bar type in David K. Barnes find all his stories and listen to all of them right from yes. the beginning to the end. That would be my recommendation for this week. Would you, would you concur with that, Philip? Well, I would, cause I've been listening to nothing but David K Barnes for the last two weeks or so. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I'm going to go search out, his, I'm going to go search out his podcast now too, can I just say, and, uh, and listen to them too. So yeah, I think all of them are fantastic worth listening to. Perfect recommendation, Dwayne. And don't just type in Barnes. Make sure it's David Kay. There's lots of Barnes on Absolutely. the Big Finish website. So it's, yes. a, it's a good name to have. <laughs> yep. That's it. I, I, I do. It is my middle uh, initial my middle name, but uh, I was originally David Barnes. And then when I realized that's a common name, putting the K in there, that helps. That really helps with the Google search algorithm. So, what does the K stand for? It stands for my middle name. That's what it it's what? For. Are you going to tell, you're not going to tell us? No, that's the secret I will take with me to the grave. Oh, it's Kevin. Okay. <laughs> It is. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's my father's. Uh, my father's name. Um, so it's just that's technically a David, son of Kevin Barnes. But that's the uh, that's the what the K stands for. But it's. Uh, I just. Um, I was looking for ways to, to make my name slightly more searchable. And I thought oh, that sounds cool. Does sound cool. Know. All right. So on that note, I'm going to wrap things up here. It's been uh, been great to uh, to be in your company, David. Thank you very much oh, for joining us. And uh, Philip. You know how much I like being in your company. Thank you so oh, much for being I with us. I love being with you too, Dwayne. Thank you. All right. We'll catch you all next time. Bye, everyone. Goodbye. This has been the Sirens of Audio episode 193, The Silent Devil, with our guest David K. Barnes and your hosts, Philip Edney and Dwayne Bunny. Theme music by Joe Kramer. More about us at sirensofaudio.com. Comment below to give us your feedback or contact us via email at sirensofaudio at gmail.com or via any one of our socials using the handle at Audio Sirens. 
Thanks for listening, Audio Files. We'll hear you next time.